Yeah, it was nice. It was a no, nice, like, kidding. can you just move out again? Fine. I'll leave. You weren't even there, there AJ. Don't, don't, you love him being there. Exactly. Don't, Wait, don't let him hurt your feelings, guys. Let's not bury the lead. Clap it up. Jason Kipnis joining foul territory. Let's go. <laughs> if, wow, you only retired for five minutes and now you're back I know. in the game, man. I saw your little Instagram, Twitter action today. The itch got me, man. And seeing you guys, what you guys have been doing on here, uh, couldn't, couldn't stay away for too long. I had to join you guys. And I like the uh, backdrop. AJ, do you have any comments on the players behind well, I mean, Jason Kipnis right now? Canerco, obviously, my man. Uh, Chipper, you know, growing up as a Braves fan. Mm -hmm. holes. I got a holes. You can't see it here. I don't want to move uh, it too much. Petey. Petey, that's extra small. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tommy. I saw Tommy this weekend in Chicago. There you go. So, I, approval? Yeah. It was a lot better than the one you had back there. We're not going to talk about that one. <laughs> we are. We took it down. <laughs> Let's just say there was a theme in uh, Kip's old uh, jerseys. <laughs> There's a very it, big theme. Yeah, and it involved things that are not allowed in baseball. <laughs> All-stars? <laughs> no, those are the allowed. Theme? They're allowed. They were all-stars. Different, different word. They were. Different word for them. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. They all They all made it to the All-Star game. Yeah. There's yes, they did. Why. So, um, Kip, what have you been up to? Um, what are you looking forward to with this as well? Obviously, you know, watching and pay attention to what we're doing here and you're really fresh out of the game and now you get to make fun of your former teammates. You know what? It was it was nice uh, not having anything to do for about maybe one month. I think <laughs> then the the boredom kind of kicks in and you're you're so used to probably having someone pull you to your next meeting or your next interview and tell you what to do next. But I mean, when you're retired and sitting at home, it's kind of up to you to how productive you want to be. So I was realizing uh, we needed to get off the couch. And uh, as much as golf is going to be my main focus of my life from here on out, I wanted to do a little bit more than that. So, Kip, wait, you, you last played in 21, right? Is that correct? Uh, 20. 20. Okay. And you announced your retirement like a month ago? No, but he was – yeah, but he was in the minors in 21. We did – uh, I'm sorry. Miners was 21. So last played in 21. Excuse me. Yeah. Okay. So that's it's all blurry. It Got all runs it. together. Because we had this argument. I had this argument. Kratz <laughs> and I have never officially sent out the Instagram we retired post. Yeah. But since I haven't played since 2016, I'm retired. <laughs> there you go. I don't know. I never understand why. I. I mean, you can. Could... People want to know if you're done though, and if you if you. So I, if I come on. out tomorrow and say I'm 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 making I'm playing, I don't have to say I'm making a comeback because I never retired. Yeah, but there's. There's a period of time. There's a grace period. What's the grace period? Ask Kip. That's he's what just, I was trying to get at. He's just, he's just been unsigned this whole time. That's right. <laughs> exactly. I never filed paperwork. I, I, I'm just I'm asking because that's what we had the discussion. Remember early on we said, what's the, what's the period of time before you have to send out the Instagram slash tweet saying you're like, Kratz never did it. No. I so, think Kratz could still catch in the big. You're saying I can't? I don't know. You're far, you saw my moves. first pitch. I, True. Trust me. I'll, I'll say this. I'll say this. The coming out and with the post and everything was more probably for myself and for personally just to like get out of that uh, that gray area, just whether I'm still trying to work out or anything like now, once you make it official, it's easier just to move on and uh, you don't think about it as much. Got it. Okay. That makes more sense. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Kratz, you can send yours out tomorrow. I think Kratz, you would have done it in, in today's world. No, I, I think you would have done it if it was right now, if you had just finished. Throw, you're, you're very active on Twitter. I think you're yeah. a Twitter fan. Yeah, now I am. Yeah. yeah, now I am, but now. Like, when I played, like, I, I, left, I left my personality in the clubhouse, so that was easy. And like I said before, Kip knows this too, I didn't retire, I quit. Like Kip, it's about your career, man. Like you, it's okay to say, like, you know, I'm not on the end of the spectrum where I'm like, you know, sophomore in college, and I'm like, oh, I'm kind of sick of baseball. Announcing my retirement, you know, I announced my retirement from the trash pandas. Like, no, like you quit, you quit playing. Like, the game got you. It's okay. Like, well, no, gets, I, gets everybody. As Hawk said, I wasn't – I didn't retire. I was retired. I, was I retired. got retired. <laughs> I got retired. That's right. So, 
But Kratz, where the heck are you? Because are you like in a prison or something? I mean, you don't watch. Are you not a foul territory person? I, I think yeah, I was. Friday we talked about it. He's got yeah, we morning. talked about Friday. Did you miss Friday's show? Uh, maybe. It's mm. on demand. You can watch it back. Mm. I'm at. I'm in Virginia. I'm in the corner in Virginia. I, uh. I was told by one of our illustrious producers slash directors to not bring any, to not bring anything to the background. So I didn't. There's you could have had like some drapes. You could have had some drapes or something. Who told you that? Hey, I'm not going to say who it was. You never name names about anything. Actually, before we get to the news of the day, this is important though for you, Kratzy. And first off, I think you can bring a little poster or something if you want next time. But Eric Kratz is a viral TikTok sensation. I'm not even just talking about the one from the other day that's, I think, getting close to 2 million views on TikTok. Got another one. What, that was Friday, right? Friday, we're just shooting the shit. Todd Frazier's on. And we're like, any of you ever experience a teammate that didn't buy a spread when he was on a minor league rehab assignment? And Frazier's like, no, no chance. No one would ever do that. And Kratz is there like <laughs> licking his chops. Oh, hell yeah. I'm going to call someone out. He didn't say the players. Name, I heard this. I heard this part of it. The story was great. This is the 30 seconds I tuned in for. Good. On Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and TikTok. That's why it went viral again. So Kratz, props to you. Uh, real quick. Wait, who was it? <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, give me a year. Just tell me what year, and I'll figure no, it out. We can talk about the it. Person has, the person hasn't retired yet. <laughs> so. Wait, they haven't announced their retirement, or they haven't retired? <laughs> no, no. They're, they're, in, they're in the limbo right now. They haven't announced their retirement. Okay. I, I'm going to say, if, I, I want to ask Kipnis about that a little bit later, just, you know, spreads, and if he's got a similar story to you, Kratzy. I'll save it for the end of the show, because we right. do have Nico Horner, Chicago Cubs star, Bo Glover. Josh Rojas from the Arizona Diamondbacks. Diamondbacks playing inspiring baseball early on this season. They, they've been taking it to the Dodgers. And Trisha Whitaker, uh, Ray's TV. She works for Apple, too. She does a great job. She's one of the best, I would say, host reporters in baseball out there. Um, and she's going to join us on the undefeated race. So we'll get to them. But let's start with O'Neill Cruz, his injury, the Pittsburgh Pirates losing their star or one of their stars and the Chicago White Sox getting to a little bit of beef. It was like a little bit of throwback to the A.J. Pierzynski days with the White Sox and the Pirates on a really awkward slide from O'Neill. I don't think we ever got in a fight with guy. the Pirates. We used to just want to love to play the Pirates. You barely played the Pirates. I know. Too. When you did, you're like, oh, hopefully we win two out of three. So if you're on YouTube with this podcast crowd, we'll, we'll describe it. That Maybe A.J. can do the description for us. Jason Mackey, who covers the Pirates every day, said – did O'Neill Cruz have a lane here? An ugly play doesn't matter at this point. Just hope Cruz is okay. And, and I can tell you that was before we found out fractured ankle. He's out for 10 to 12 weeks. So how would you describe the slide that came in from O'Neill Cruz? Well, we had Buster Posey on last week, right? Yep. And this is a direct correlation to that rule that they changed because of the time when he got hurt. He O'Neill Cruz didn't know what to do. He didn't know how to slide. He didn't know what... Sebi Zavala was doing because the throw was kind of up and to his right. So he jumped for it. And when he came down, O'Neill Cruz didn't know what to do. Now, the on deck hitter needs to be back there and tell him, like, slide, get down, whatever. You got to get back there quickly. I thought it was everyone's saying it was a dirty play. It was not a dirty play by anybody. It was just an awkward play because O'Neill Cruz didn't know what the heck he was doing. And we made all these rules where you can't touch the catcher and you can't touch the second baseman and you can't do this, you can't do that. Like, Let's let O'Neill Cruz take a freaking shot at Zebby Zavala and see what happens. Like, he crushes him right there. He would have laid him he out. He laid him out. But yeah. you know what? That's part of your job as a catcher. You get laid out, you get up, live to fight another day. But it was just because of the rule. It was just an awkward situation. And he didn't know the throw was coming because it was coming from the third baseman. If you watch him, he tried to run inside the line to kind of get in Zavala's way, which is the right play. But then no one was telling him where to slide or what to do. And he tried to slide kind of at the end. And then, unfortunately, he got hurt, which is the worst part of this whole thing. But then they played the feud, which I like. <laughs> well, what do you think, Kratzy, first off, about someone like him? And he's a big dude coming in to slide like that. Um, can he just truck stick him next time? I mean, he can because he's in the way. Technically, it's not high school. The rule is you just aren't allowed to deviate your path to take the catcher out. Obviously, it is a gray area. And I think we, we had a play in the Braves game where um, I'm not sure who it was. Odor, that's right. Thank you. Yeah, it was Odor just ran right through home plate. Now, he collided with Darno, but the ball came out. If 
Cruz does that right there, if he runs through home plate and he takes Savala out, like I don't, I don't one, I don't know if he lives. Two, Cruz might stay healthy, and three, the ball might come out too. So if he's in the lane, you're allowed to run through him. Unfortunately, he picked like the run through. Oh crap, he's here, and that's where I think that ankle got got twisted up and Savalo, I mean, Savalo in the moment, I think he was angry. I saw post game. He, it was, you know, it was kind of like in the moment he was pissed and, you know, that's where the whole bench clearing came when Kopech and Santana got into it a little bit. But I just, I I just think it's something it's so, it sounds so dumb that major league baseball players have to work on sliding, but every single spring training that I went to, we worked on sliding and you have to, you have to think about it. Because if he doesn't make that decision in enough time, bad stuff can happen. It could have happened to Sevy too. Sevy could have gotten hurt on that play also. But luckily, you know, he didn't. I think they nailed it. I think the both of them called out. It's the indecision that he had. He looked like he was going to slide the whole way. Uh, and then that ball kind of surprised him. And he tried to stand up at the last second. But it, all of his momentum, he couldn't stop. So he was too close. And just was an awkward awkward movement that he made right into the catcher. He kind of couldn't get out of the way in time. So it was just, it was just indecision on his part. And AJ's right. He didn't have the teammate behind him telling him what to do behind uh, the catcher. Zavala was pissed. He was pissed. He was pissed. I don't think he realized. No, he was, listen, as as a, as a catcher, I think crowds agrees. When you get hit, you're pissed at first. You get up, you're, you're pissed. I mean, there's no, like, it's okay. You know, it's part of your job, but when you get hit, you're, there's, there's that adrenaline that goes, right? You're like, yeah, son of a bitch, let's go, <laughs> right? And, yeah. then he, and then he realized he was hurt. But the thing was, Carlos Santana was standing right there. So Zavala clearly said something to O'Neill Cruz as he was on the ground. I mean, he was you could tell he was hurt. But Zavala didn't know that. But he said something. I don't know what he said. No, We'll never probably ever find out. And then you see Kopech get pissed. And you see that's when they – and the whole time the trainer – is laying on the ground with O'Neill Cruz, and they're they're. Eh. He was kind of protecting him in a good yeah, way. Yeah. Like no, you don't want anyone like running around, uh, yeah. falling back on him, stepping on him. Yeah, but I listen. I I was okay with every part of that play was fine except for O'Neill Cruz getting hurt. That was the the terrible part. But I mean, we need more of this. We need more like let's let's push each other around. You know, let's let's get into a shoving match every once in a while. It's okay. It's the worst thing in the world. When you get hit the plate, it's like banging your head. Like if you're like getting something out of a cabinet and you leave the cabinet open and you bang your head, that anger that you feel is the exact. When I bang my head on something and I didn't realize it, that's the same anger. When somebody hits you, your first instinct is not like, oh, hey, hey, how you doing? Like as you're like looking at the guy on the ground. No, you're like, it just, even though you expect, even though you expect it, it just, like AJ said, it just boils up. It's like. Ah, who's your worst blow up? Who that got, got you the, me? Who, yeah, that got you the best. Chipper Jones. Really? Chipper Jones in his last season absolutely depleted me. I had no idea. It's my man. That's oh, why he's yeah. up here. Yeah. It's my favorite play. He signed a picture. <laughs> <laughs> he signed a picture for me, and my legs are basically like wrapped around his upper body. And my mask is in the air and I'm horizontal. And he signed a picture for me. Bruh, you are blocking the moon. <laughs> I like it. I was like, yeah, great. I and like he was it. like 40 or 41. It was his last season. And he just annihilated me. But I also tried to get, I got, he tried to run me over. Prince Fielder tried to run me over. Ooh. If you pull the video up. One of us stays up. One of us is on the ground. Just saying. You allayed him, didn't you? You allayed him. Hey, hey. We, I played. I played during the digital video era, so we don't have to check the VCR and fix the tracking on it. So we can definitely we check the video. That's all. Okay. Understand. So here's the other thing for the Pirates. It sucks. They're off it, to a nice start. I mean, they're not going to be good. They're they're going to be bad, but. They were off to a nice start, and this is definitely a top three player on the team. I'd say Brian Reynolds is the star of the team. Fair. But O'Neal Cruz is kind of the future. He has the highest Especially ceiling. if they don't trade Brian Reynolds. Yes. He's definitely the future. I mean, he's what? Hardest throw in StatCast history, hardest home run in StatCast history, fastest runner in StatCast history, and he's 6'7", mm-hmm. playing shortstop. He, 
he's their face. He just hasn't played long enough. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a big blow for the Pirates. They're six and three. Yeah. So it's a team that could have been fun to follow for the first couple of months. But they're trying to build something. Yeah. And then you lose the face, like Kip just said. You lose the face guy for three, two to three months. Half the season. That's a big deal. Because mm-hmm. that's two to three months he's not there, t- getting at bats, working with his teammates, being around. I mean, he might be around, but not. It's different when you're on the IL than when you're like actually in the fight with the boys. So this is a big deal. Yeah. No, and sucks. you think about and you think about you know fractured ankles, you know what what Correa is going through right now, or what he went through in the off season. Like, is there is there residual stuff from that? You hope not, but the dude's six seven. There's, there's a lot. That's his foundation. There's a lot. There's a lot on top of that ankle. You ever? Uh, so you're trying to say that he was going to get offered like three 10 year three hundred million dollar deals, and they're going to fail him because he broke his ankle against in this one play? I'm just saying one guy did it, so they set a precedence. So he's only going to wear off-whites for the rest of his life like Carlos does now? He only wears one pair of shoes? <laughs> he's got to find just that one pair. The one pair he can only wear all the time? Oh, Correa? Yeah. During that interview? Yeah. So let's keep it in the NL Central. We have maybe about 10 minutes before we talk Rays with Trisha Whitaker. Uh, the Cardinals are off to a disappointing start record-wise. They're 3-6. and six. They're at the bottom of the division. It's super early, but... Two things stood out from the weekend. Number one, Jordan Walker's got the hit tool. I mean, he has a nine-game hitting streak to start his career. He is one of, if not the youngest players in the bigs. He's 6'6", 245, big dude. It doesn't look like he's an easy out either. I mean, he's not just a home run hitter. I think you're seeing that with his play coverage right now. Well, that's why he's on the team. Because mm-hmm. he can hit? Because he can hit. Yeah, no shit. I but, mean, that's why he made yeah. the team at 20 years old. He, <laughs> I mean, they have some outfielders, and we talked about this a little bit, where they're going to get him at bats. But nine-game hitting streak, hitting 350, a couple homers. I mean, he's on this team to swing the pole. He's not mm-hmm. there to, to play gold glove outfield. He's there to get some hits. But he's not all or nothing. No, no, when no. He's a good at hitter. A profile like that, you often say, oh, he's a big dude. He's going to hit 40 <laughs> homers and strike out a million times and hit, you know, 240. I mean, no. This is a potential 300 hitter. This, is a, just, this guy's got a chance to be not only an all-star, but a perennial all-star and you know, be in the mix for some other awards. Yep. He doesn't look too phased right now either, Kip. I mean, you're, you're coming into a big spot. You got Goldie and Arenado and all these big dudes, which might make it easier for you, frankly, because you don't have to carry the team. That's what I was going to say, that you, it's nice to have those two guys kind of behind you in the lineup or with you in the lineup. And uh, probably two of the better guys who probably just go about their business each day with their routines. Uh, that he can kind of just follow along and see what they do and just kind of copy them. But if you're having this kind of comfort and success at 20 years old, you got a bright future ahead of you. No doubt. I mean, come on. Like, this dude, you know, I think the size is why you get picked, why you had the opportunity. And then he showed his ability in spring training. We talked a lot about his mental makeup, too, his – his character traits are seem off the charts, but man, when you start your career with a nine game hitting streak and his hits are like you said, Scotty, like it's not just all or nothing dingers. He's racking balls back up the middle. He's facing some legit, some legit pitchers too. You know, the whole, the whole Brewers rotation he was facing in this, in this last series, like, it's it's impressive. I'm not quite switching my I'm not switching my NL Rookie of the Year vote yet, but he definitely started out where you want to start out, especially when you kind of have some flux in that outfield. Even though they have a lot of options, they got some flux with some hustle quote hustle issues. Crouch, can you please like turn on your fake background? Are you on a computer or like an iPad? Because <laughs> it, it, it seriously, it, is it just, bugging you? It is. It's just your big head. Blink twice if you're in a hostage situation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, I started the show. <laughs> la- last time I started the show, on Friday, I started the show. Like <laughs> <Yes. this. laughs> I, it is, it's fine. It's, it's fine. Guys. It's just funny. There's no ba- – there's you at least. What do you want? You want him to Like, there's got to be some curtains time? or something. The well, there's no curtain. Help. I mean, you just put curtains, hang up curtains on the wall. AJ, what you have to do Isn't is there a window sh- in? Where are you? Are you in a, like a padded room? Is there no window? <laughs> it's like an office. Are you in a house? Yeah. We couldn't have picked a room with like a window? Where other people are? I tell them to stay out. Well, Daddy's I mean, got to work. Like you, like this is just an office. I mean, there's 
if I turned it around and showed all the other things that are on here, that you guys would be like, whoa, there's some like sick like Africa like poster and stuff like that. Like there's there's a bookshelf. What you have to do, AJ, is there's actually a hidden picture. Oh, in, stare into it? In the wall, you gotta stare into it. So we yeah, got but your head's in the way. Two hours. Your head's in the way. My head's not in the way. My head is blocking <laughs> blocking sailboat. a butter churner. Oh, your head's blocking the sailboat that I'm supposed to stare at. Yes. Yes. It's I an elephant. Get to this one too. So um, while AJ makes fun of your background, uh, <laughs> as if you're when you were on the road in Chicago. I had a curtains behind me. Oh, curtains. So it breaks oh, it thank up. You. Champ. Thank and you. a lamp. The people's <laughs> champ, everyone. AJ Przinsky. Did What's the carpet match on? the curtains when you were yeah. there? Yes. Four seasons, bro. Come on. Oh, come on. Four seasons only. It's in the contract for AJ. 300th home run this weekend for Nolan Arenado against the Brewers. Congratulations to him. Eighth player to have 300 homers and 10 gold gloves. And he's still got a lot of career to go, too. Yeah. Like, he should Hall be a lot for he's, he's in. 500. Yeah, he's well, in. Yeah, uh, 500. Yeah. Right? He's 30. I mean, he's still got a lot. Two? He's in. 32. Tops. No, he's in the Hall oh, of Fame. Yeah. You're Is he in that. today? If he's going to play, he's got like seven more years on that deal. No, I think he's in today. I think if his career ended, ended today, tonight, he's in? he would be a Hall of Famer. He's 31. He's not. 31, okay. He's not a lock? He's not allowed. He has to get to 10 years of service. How close oh. is he? Is, is, he's got 10 gold gloves. He must well, be- if, he's, if he gets hurt, he's on the IL. He's going to get the service time, so he's yeah. in. He's coming up. He's coming up on it Saturday. Oh, I just looked cool. it up. I think Saturday. It'll be, I think it'll be okay. Oh, we should have him on yeah. next week to celebrate it. I'm trying to. I tried to get a hold Working of him. See, see okay. if he responds. Kip's his boy. He took him out in Tempe and Scottsdale at ASU, and they were boys out there. I mean, let's he, go, Kip. He was. He was my recruit in college. I was trying to get him to sign at ASU. Thought I did a good job. I showed him a good time, which isn't that hard at ASU, but. Uh, <laughs> I think he knew something I did it that he was going to go on to be a pretty decent player. So he said no. What was the process like? He didn't say no. I think he just said yes to maybe probably his first round signing bonus, which he got. Right. Was there, (laughs) was there a call or a text exchange? Like, Hey dude, that was great time. Wish we could have played together, but I'm getting two, $3 million to play for the Rockies. I want to say yes, but you're assuming I remember much from those times. So, (laughs) Let's wait, hold, yes. wait, wait, how old are you? What do you mean? 36. Damn, how many years were you at ASU? I mean, what were you, like a fifth-year senior and he was an incoming freshman? I was 08 and 09 I was there. So I think he came as like a – I'm trying to think. How old is he then? He's got to be 31. Yeah, that makes sense. That evens out. That checks out. AJ, Five they're years. called doctors. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't know they had those at ASU. I thought they only had yeah, yeah. online degrees at ASU. A lot of people go to school for seven years. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy boy. Uh, well, the th- this was the funny part, too. The 300th home run is caught by a fan. Didn't want anything for it, although, of course, they're going to give him you know, autographed merch and probably tickets and all of that. But his 250th home run back in June of 2021 is kept by the fan because – the fan wanted 10 G's. No. That's a no for me, dog. Yeah. I've never heard no. that before. 10 for G's? Eight, 10 G's for the 250th if, I have a home question, run? If it was his 500th and the fan. Well, even, that might be, you can question the fans. No. Whatever. Awesome. But re- so, You're on. just a bad human if you want that. Okay. But if a fan said 10 G's for your 500th home run ball, no. you're a no? Yeah. Ten, uh, well, if I hit 500, I got lots of money. So I'm thinking, yeah, it might be 10 G's. Yeah. It's not. That's probably that that's 250, not that though. Big a deal. 250 is going to hit way more. That's not like a big round. No, 250. No, eh. I agree. 250, whatever. If he, And it's probably partially principal, if anything. But Kip, 10 I'd, G's. You can I'd, question the fans, you know, integrity or whatever they're thinking. But 10 G's. I'd rather, they, I'd rather they keep the ball because they want the ball, not because they didn't get their ransom note met. <laughs> that I'm more okay in line with that. Ten G's for my five hundredth makes a little bit more sense, but it's just I don't know. Write up a check that bounces before they cash it. Hey Kratz, hold <laughs> up the help sign if you need ten G's to get out of your hostage situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you catch a historic home run ball that might be worth well into six figs or seven figs, like Yeah. Gosh, you're, you just, a, keep that, you're just a right? bad human if you do that, though. Yeah, I but it doesn't. Like. It do, it's not valuable to you. There's not like yeah. like I get it. It's worth like the 62 is worth something, but to Aaron Judge, 
he's not going to be like, oh man, I'm so glad I got that ball back so that I can sell it when I'm 55. Like that's the part that's hard is where I think if 250 really meant a lot to Arenado, I think the team should step up and be like, hey, uh, that's one of our baseballs. We need it back. True. Like, not who, allowed. Who was the guy? Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Tom oh. Brady's last touchdown. He bought it for like yeah. five hundred grand. And Tom's like, "Oh yeah, I'm coming back." By the way, there's a lot more footballs to be. I mean, that's. I don't know. I just feel like that's so. That's such a gray area for me with fans. I mean, I get it. The money you can get a million dollars for a baseball. I get it. But man, it's just. I don't know. No, you keep it. That's just how baseball works. And it's a big part of it for fandom where in basketball, the ball goes into the seats. They don't yeah, but my say, boy, okay, you keep the basketball. <laughs> my boy, my boy Minkavich had the ball from 04 and he got crucified. But he kept it, right? No, he had to give it. They oh, made him did. give it back. Like they, Well, he's a player. He's but a they, team employee. But they blasted him to a point where uh, in Boston where he had to give it back to him. But he had really? it in like his basement somewhere. Josh Tolley. Josh Tolley caught the only no-hitter in Mets history before last year, and they took his catching equipment that he used for the game to put in the Mets Hall of Fame, and they didn't give him anything for it. A some some autograph memorabilia person offered him 150 grand for his catching equipment that he caught that he used in that game, and the Mets took it, saying that it was theirs. No, did they pay for it? That's interesting. Mm. Nope. No, that is juicy. There needs to be some ground rules set for this stuff. Anyway, biggest story of the week right now is the Tampa Bay Rays undefeated. So let's move to that for now. Trisha Whitaker does an amazing job covering this team uh, for Rays television. Friend of mine, Trisha, great to see you. And a big smile, of course, right now. Why the hell not? I mean, you're covering oh, the, the only hey, undefeated team smiling, in baseball. If I'm not smiling, that's a problem. Exactly. So, smiling. so thank you for joining us, and and good afternoon with some tea or coffee or or whatever you got going on there. Yes, cheers to you and to a great start for Tampa Bay. Um, how much fun are you having, and is this team having right now? Like, give us something good that you've observed that looks different. I don't think that you can possibly quantify how much fun this team is having right now. And if you're not having fun when you're nine and zero, then you probably shouldn't be playing baseball. Uh, last night we saw them. It, the, the thing that stands out to me about this team, and not to sound like cliche and team talk or whatever, but they really are playing for each other. So last night, a prime example of that was Harold Ramirez busting it to second base so that Brandon Lau could step up and hit the grand slam. The guys were all talking about that in the clubhouse afterwards, just the energy that they're playing with. How could you not play with energy? when everything's clicking on all cylinders for you. You got good starting pitching. Your bullpen's incredible, even though they haven't had to be used much at all this season. And the offense is just putting up runs left and right. So it's it's been incredible. Trisha, how, like, are, do they believe in their start? Do they, be, have they believed in this? I mean, nobody <laughs> believes in nine, you know, nine and oh, but do they believe that they were going to have this kind of season before the season coming out of spring? Oh, man. First of all, I'm so, like, sick of that narrative on Twitter. People being like, oh, the Rays haven't played anybody, blah, 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 blah. You don't win nine games in a row on accident. This is the example of the identity that this team is going to have this season. But honestly, Eric, to answer your question, I think that they did believe that this is how they could be when they're fully healthy. When you look at what happened to them last year, all of their top hitters were injured for months at a time. When that happens and you're rolling out basically a AAA lineup for a couple months at a time, that's not going to go very well. Um, so you had Manuel Margot, Wander Franco, Harold Ramirez, Brandon Lau um, on the IL for huge chunks of times last season. Now they're all fully healthy, and you're seeing what this lineup can do when they are fully healthy. So the narrative that the Rays didn't go out and get a big bat this offseason, at this point, in my opinion, that's a tired narrative. Stop talking about that because they – trusted the guys that they have when they're fully healthy. You look at a Wander Franco fully healthy and how he started the season, a Brandon Lau fully healthy and how he has started the season. Um, I'm done with that narrative, and I'm also done with the narrative that the Rays just have played bad teams to start the season. I get it. They have. But you don't put up this this many runs on accident, and you don't win nine, nine games in a row on accident. I think that's one of the the best things I've liked about the Rays is you, you hear that they don't go and get that big bat. They don't have these huge signings. Well, there's also no real big egos in the clubhouse then. 
And you've got these guys who are all kind of around the same age, coming up together, playing together, and now they're experiencing winning together. Who do you see kind of taking that Kevin Kiermeyer role, that leadership role? Who's kind of starting to take uh, take over in the clubhouse where you can their personalities are starting to put them up uh, top? Honestly, I would say Shane McClanahan. Um, I think he's the leader in that clubhouse. He's their all star from last season, and you know he's their ace. Um, I think that he's probably a leader in the clubhouse. Brandon Lau, he would be another leader because believe it or not, he's a veteran at this point in that clubhouse. Um, but you're, you're exactly right. And like, I hate it when like team reporters go out there and they're like, oh, this team doesn't have an ego. Well, really, you have to say that. I really, truly believe what you just said. This team does not have an ego. I work with these guys every single day, all day long. They have to do interviews with me, whether they like it or not, and they always have a good attitude about it. And there's really not an ego in that clubhouse. But I love that you brought up Kevin Kiermeyer because he was the guy who would do all those crazy dances in the clubhouse afterwards. But now, after every game, it's Shane McClanahan that gets up in front of the team in the clubhouse after they win, and he names a player of the game. Um, and then Ryan Thompson in the bullpen, he's the one that does the dances and leads the dances because Kevin Kiermeyer used to do that. So there's a lot of leadership in that clubhouse. And like you said, there's, there's no egos. And you know who that starts with? That starts with Kevin Cash because he's a manager that doesn't have an ego either at all. He lets everybody be who they want to be in the clubhouse and he has no ego. Trisha, first of all, your leader can't be a starting pitcher. They're not out there enough. I, I know you're, you're, you're going to laugh and say, aha, yeah, he can't. You're only out there once every five days. Okay, who else, who so who's the everyday you player? You said Brandon then, Lau. AJ? It has who to be an everyday you? player because they're out there every day. As Adam Dunn used to call them, they're kickers. They're special teams players. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to look at that lineup. There's not even a guy who's – Wander Franco is so young. Yeah, he's a leader, but he's still so young. The only other guy who I would say in that lineup who's been there long enough, like I said, would be Brandon Lau. Okay. So it's – Clanahan and Brandon Lau, but Shane is is a leader. I know he's not an everyday player, obviously, but but he's always out there, and he's a, he's he's a leader. Okay, so Trisha, you're, you're you've already popped the champagne for the Rays to be in the postseason, okay? But do you know the last team <laughs> that started that nine and zero? Hey, you know AJ, who the last team was. AJ, you, you I don't know if you remember this. You and I got in a, in a debate one time. Uh, oh, I remember. Oh, we're gonna get, we're gonna, no. we'll get there. Hold on, we'll get there. But do you remember the last team that started nine and zero in the in the and to start an MLB season, do you remember who they were? Do you know who they were? The Royals in 2003. Yeah, what happened to them? You this team is comparable to the Kansas City Royals. You need to read John Romano's piece in the Tampa Bay Times today about why the Rays are different than that team. He literally broke it down number by number and why this team is different than that team. And you've got to also look – I know, you think it's just team talk, but that's fine. The average <laughs> margin of victory for the Rays – is 6.3 runs per game. The Royals weren't doing that. And the Rays have only had one close game in this nine-game span, and that wasn't the case for the Royals. Okay, Nats, A's, there was the other one, Tigers. Okay. Tigers. Um, the difference between the 03 Royals and the, and the 2023 Rays for me, Kevin Cash and Tony Pena. I mean, I'm just going to leave it at that, and we'll go. You, okay. you can dig into that, Trisha, all you want. Uh, there, there, that's a little I won't bit of a tell difference. You, hey, listen, Tony I Pena didn't have an ego either. I, I, won't, I, I won't tell you how old I was in 2003 because uh, I don't remember the Kansas City Royals in 2003. So I will let you be the expert on that, AJ, if you want to be. Yeah, somebody won that division that year, and I, I, was, I was on that team. <laughs> but seriously, you can't possibly look at the Rays and think it's a fluke. You can't. I mean, no, you, I, you know, no, of course you not. Can't. Of course I'm not. It's just fun to... To, to give you a little bit of grief, because like I said, you've already popped the champagne. You're already planning a trip to Houston for the first round of the playoffs. I mean, it's okay. I have... there, no, go ahead. Somebody go. Well, so, and then I want to go right back to AJ on, on, on the debate, because AJ seems to have um, a lot of great debates with the great reporters out there in baseball. But but first off, for me, so I'm, I'm somewhat in between here, Trisha, because for me, I have the Rays as a playoff team, no doubt, okay? Now they're, they're plus 145. They're favored to win the East. So I'm looking at the schedule. True or false? They had the easiest schedule to start the season. They're playing the three. These are these three teams are locks to lose True. 100 games. True. True. Right? True. So that's all for me is like if, if they had lost one, it's not really that much of a story right now. It's that they didn't lose any. And I give them all the credit in the world. I do. I think they're going to be a really good team, potentially a 100-win team. 
but I don't think this is just going to be this like epic, incredible ball club. And this week will be more interesting to see. It's not like this team's going to start 18 and 0 or something like that. I hope they do. I hope they do as well. I'm just saying like it, th- we do. I, some people are like, that's BS. Like they're crushing these teams. I get it. That's great. But these are the three worst teams in baseball. So I just want to make sure I take it with a grain of salt and not, I've, I've just like you, I've played this game a million times as a broadcaster where we, I fall in love with the team and then they break my heart later on. And in this regard, I'm not saying they're a playoff. I mean, I'm not saying they're not a playoff team, but I'm not going to look at them being like, they're going to run away with the East. Now. I think there's no chance of that. I don't think they're going to run away with, from the, bleh. I don't think they're going to run away with the East, but when you think about it, one of the things, and you guys know this best of all in baseball, you have to win the games you're supposed to win. And in 2021, the division came down to who played better against the Orioles and the Rays went 19 and one against the Orioles and the rest of the division did not. And they won the division granted in the playoffs. They lost to the Red Sox and that sucked. But what I'm saying is you have to win the games that you're supposed to win. And I, I mean, I hate to do, say this, but the Tigers went out there and beat the Astros twice. It's not like it's, it's not easy to win nine games in a row, no matter who you're playing. And also, like I said, you have to look at the numbers and you have to look at what they have this season. That starting rotation is sick. It's filthy. And when they get Tyler Glass now back and they don't have to use Josh Fleming anymore, that's going to be even even harder for the opponents coming in. Um, and as long as the offense stays healthy, I think that they're going to continue, not obviously at this pace, but I think that, like you said, they're going to contend for the East and they are a playoff team. So, Tricia, is it weird for you as a Rays reporter not having openers? Like, you actually have a starting rotation. Well, There's but no now Ryan Stanek coming out there throwing one <laughs> inning, and then we're going to bring in, the, we're going to trick you with Yarbrough yeah, throwing sidearm lefty for the next three, and then we're going to bring in the sidearm. Like, you actually have a real pitching staff. Congratulations. Well, now you, you kind of spoke too soon, AJ, because they're using an opener today. Ah, there we go. There, there we, we go. go. <laughs> Let's try the trick baseball again. Jalen Beeks is opening for Josh Fleming. Josh Fleming had a really bad outing, his last outing. I mean, it, was, it wasn't good. And um, so they're using Jalen Beeks today. But, no, I, I understand what you're saying. It is very strange not having an opener and not being like, all right, how are they going to piece it together this week? Like, who's going to be in that opener role? Who, you know, because the Rays don't really have defined roles in the bullpen. They just don't. Um, and, yeah, it's been strange, but it's, but it's been nice because when you look at it, Shane McClanahan, Zach Eflin, Drew Rasmus, and Jeffrey Springs, and then soon to be Tyler Glass. Now that's that's a rotation that you don't need an opener for. So as soon as Glass now comes back, I don't think we're going to see the opener unless there's an injury. So I watched the Phillies last year as one of the radio part-time radio guys. They did the exact same thing. They beat all the teams they're supposed to beat. They beat the Nats. They beat the Pirates. They went into Cincinnati, beat them. The 500 teams. They could barely beat them. They couldn't beat the Cubs. And Mm -hmm. they came within two games of the World Series. So don't let AJ, don't let AJ bully you into thinking, even Scott a little bit. Scott was bullying you a little bit. Enjoy your run, enjoy your champagne in that mug. Hey, I knew that you were the good one on this podcast because you had a a cup of coffee with the Rays and I interviewed you in the Yankees clubhouse when you got, uh, you were there for what, like three days or something? Three minutes. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Best three minutes of my life. Eric's tried, to, Eric's tried the cup of coffee at every every team. <laughs> I know. Nine, ten, how many is it? <laughs> Nine big league teams, 14 organizations. I think you hit it on the head, though, with that rotation. Uh, if you show up as a position player and you look at the projected starters each day and you feel like you have the better one, that's how those winning streaks kind of get going. If you feel like you're the favorite every day, it's, it builds confidence for that team, especially with an impressionable young lineup a little bit. I think they're going to just have as much fun with this as they can. Yeah, that's exactly right. Totally agree. And they're having fun right now. Wander Franco is having a lot of fun. He started the season. That's the other thing I feel like people haven't talked about enough is Wander Franco fully healthy this season. Because we saw him in 2021, obviously, when he got called up and made his MLB debut. And he had that insane on-base streak and was already making history. But in 2022, you know, he got injured twice. His hamstring and then he fractured his wrist. This is the first full season of Wander Franco, who obviously has the potential to be one of the best players to ever play the game. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Again. There we go, AJ. We're going to let Scott, and then we'll get into the debate we had in Houston. I knew you'd bite on that one. He's still got braces. It's a little early. Yeah, thank you, Kip. 
So I, I want to see- move to his, his star <laughs> teammate, Randy Rosarena. I'll phrase it this way to have, and this will be like the headline if, if someone puts it out there. Is Randy Rosarena trying now? And I say that because I heard some comments from Kevin Cash last week about how he's focusing. There's been an uptick in focus to his craft. He's preparing more on how pitchers attack him, how to beat pitchers on the base paths. And sure, you develop as a player and learn more about the prep and the mental side of the game. But that's a lot of the battle. So if he was just kind of playing on his natural ability and now he's actually like studying, that sounds like a huge win for the race. So that's what I mean by trying. Is he full on and all around preparation guy now in addition to what he does on the field? You know, Scott, I wouldn't go so far as to say full-on preparation guy now because part part of what makes Randy Randy is the fact that he plays kind of just on a whim. Like, he doesn't really plan anything. Like, he just kind of goes with it, and that's what makes him good. But you are right in that. I remember during spring training, we talked to Randy, and one of the first things he said to us, almost we didn't even, like, ask him a question about this, but he made a point to look at us and say – I'm kind of changing my pregame routine and I'm going to be a lot more focused and prepared now. So whether that means studying more, like you said, or that just means being more focused, I'm not really sure, but whatever he has done in terms of his consistency, when he comes to the ballpark every day, um, I'd say it's been working, but you don't, you don't want to take away that part of his game though, because that's just how he plays, right? He, he plays 100% all the time and he doesn't always have a plan. Um, but that's, kind of how he operates and that's what has given him success like I guarantee you if you asked him about 2020 in the postseason in 2020 he'd be like um no I didn't have a plan and I probably didn't do a whole lot of studying but that's kind of how he works best so but I do think there is something to the fact that he's changing his routine up a little bit at the ballpark um and 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 he's gotten a little bit more consistent with his preparation I would say so that's fair that's fair I'm See, all for AJ- I'm all for this because I didn't watch nothing on hit pitchers when I hit Ever? No. No. Just yeah, screw it. You it shows me the, way. It I gotta tell me one of these pitches. Were, I'm gonna swing at it. So who cares? I like it. it. I like how it. How good you were? Oh no, that has nothing to do with that. It tells you, you how, stu- Griffey. how stupid it was. You were Orlando. No, I would. I would go and hit and stuff, but I just wouldn't watch a lot on the pitch. No tendencies. No. Hey, this guy throws his slider eighty <laughs> percent of the That's time. That's the one thing I would look strikes. at. I look at pitch count, uh, count charts, and because I guessed on every pitch, so that's what I was. One thing I would look at. His count chart. Well, but but, I wasn't like watching video of a guy. Hey, this guy throws curveballs. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> but don't you think that helps you not overthink it as much? Yes, like when a 100%. guy simplify things that simplifies things at the plate, I feel like he plays a lot looser. I mean, I've I, never stood the plate, but that's I, just. I agree. Then you, you don't have want him studying behind, too much. Then you have Somebody... the guy behind Kip's right shoulder down there, Canerco, that you know he analyzed how he would walk to the box every at bat. So I mean, there's different ways to <laughs> to, to do everything, right? So, Trisha, what you, you we got into? It. We got into it. A, was it twenty? It was it twenty? Nineteen? No, I think it was. It was in Houston. The year Glassnow was tipping his pitches. Oh, it, that was twenty. It was twenty. No, it wasn't twenty because that was 20, twenty. Oh, it was 2019 twenty nineteen in Houston. Rays had just lost to the Astros. And then go go ahead and explain how I was right. <laughs> no, I actually think we had two separate arguments or debates, and I'm not entirely sure which one you're referring to or which one you remember the best. So you're going to well, have to I, go. <laughs> well, I'm talking about the one I, ha- I had a long talk with Hein Bloom, and I think it's the one you're talking about. And you said, why can't we? He asked me the same question. Why can't we win? And I said, you guys don't have a star. The, the Rays oh. are great, but oh, you don't oh, have oh. a star. But now you've anointed, you've anointed Wander Franco as the best player to ever play baseball. Okay, but so th- but then but see, I anointed him as that, and then you had a problem with it. But you still think we need a star, right? I mean, is that where we're going with this? Is he a star at the moment? Yeah, I think he is a star at the moment. Okay, is he a transcending? Look at what do you need here? You need what, a star. Point? You need Wanda a star. Franco's not a star. Not a. Oh, star is Wander at the not level a star? Of, I'm talking like Altuve, Bregman. When people say Wander Franco, not hardcore baseball fans, nobody knows who Wander Franco is. So you want him to? That doesn't more. mean that doesn't mean nope. anything. I'm not you talking need, about. You need your like biggest it. players in the biggest moments. Jordan Alvarez, step up. He's their probably the Astros' best hitter right now. In the biggest moment, guess who stepped up? Bryce Harper, in the moment against the Padres. Guess who was there? And guess who happened? Well, to be okay. Out 
AJ, Wander Franco. What are you talking about? This like, was before relax. Wander Franco was even there. Okay. Yeah. And I said, and he go, and Heimblum and, and Trisha probably had the same argument said, we got that guy coming, Wander Franco. And then for the last two years, he's been hurt. So, I mean, it's kind of like. He was yeah. good when he was on the field. Last year. But he was good when he was on the field. And the other thing, AJ, that oh, you was have Tyler to be- Glass now. But when you're talking about a guy who can have that big hit in that big moment, I know they lost to the Red Sox in the postseason in 2021, but Wander did have a big hit in that moment in 2021. I mean, he can't do it all on his own, but he did come through in that moment. And you got to give him a little bit of time. I mean, I, I do think he is a star. And I, I think I somewhat agree with you on that, somewhat. But I don't know that I agreed with you on that with the 2019 squad, but that's in the past. So <laughs> He needs those situations to become a star. We'll put it that way. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But he's, no, he's listen. He's an unbelievable talent. But again, we we just Trisha said it. When when he's on the field. Yeah, but it's it's early. Like, I don't think this is this isn't necessarily okay. a guy you're looking at that he's going to. This isn't Byron Buxton. Okay, <laughs> Byron's had trouble staying on the field for a long time now. Why? But it starts early in your career. And if you can't stay on early in your career when you're 19 years old, how the heck are you going to stay on the no, field when you're 30? Well, he, okay, he first of all, first of all, no. A big knee injury, and he looks pretty good to me on the field every day. Fair. He is – Wander can stay on the field. Last year, his big injury was when he got hit by a pitch on his wrist, and he fractured it. What? The, how is he supposed to stay on the field through that? I mean, that's not just like a – I did that once. No. I played in two weeks later. I, mean, oh, I don't stop. know. Get out of the way. Yeah, thank you, Ken. <laughs> Get out of the way. <laughs> This is a tough crowd, Trisha. Yeah, <laughs> you, you thought you were walking yeah. into these layup questions. We're going to take in. This is what I currently deal with. I, uh, trust me, AJ. After our debate in 2019, I knew there would be no. Was there layup. another one that I forgot no. about? Because please tell me the other one that I was right about. And this happens a lot, Trisha. This happens you like know, every I, single reporter we have on. We were debating. Now this, this, we don't have time to get into this, but I think we were debating about the role of a sideline reporter on a broadcast. Oh, in- gosh. <laughs> and and what well, was define it? Take here? No, I was. I'm all for it. I'm all for it. <laughs> you were kind of for it, but you kind of were like you were. You took. I feel at least from what I remember. I think I had had two glasses of wine by then. But I think <laughs> <laughs> doesn't take much. Um, I think that you said something like um, it gets in the way of the game or something in no, baseball. No, 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 no. Whoa. No, I did not. What I said was sometimes. W- in the flow of a game, when you're doing a game, the producer will hit you in the ear and say, well, we got to get Trisha on the end of the game. It's the fourth inning. So sometimes there's a good flow going and you don't want to, you know. That's the play-by-play is fault if they haven't brought the reporter in. I've never worked with you, Scott. Game. I've never worked with you. Well, there's some people that don't like to stop talking. That's exa- Thank you, Scott. That is the point I made to AJ at that Houston, <laughs> after that Houston loss. I, I know happy. someone here. I'll give just an example because Eric Kratz is a specialist at like calling people out, but then he doesn't say their name, because which is fair because I want to keep hearing the stories. There is a broadcaster who told another broadcaster who's really good. I get the first few innings, the play by play. I get the first few innings. This isn't even to the to the sideline, to the person next to him, the the former big leaguer. First few innings are me. Okay. You can start coming in about halfway through the game. I'll get mm. you involved a little bit more. I want to do my intros, get some stories in, whatever. So, I know who that was. I'm not going to use <laughs> that. Is just not the move. <laughs> the egos, the egos, and and I'm and again, I'm not naming any names. I work with some great people, but I've worked all over the place. The <laughs> egos, Brian Anderson. The egos. <laughs> I, I, know, I know. You know. I'm, I'm talking about who she works with. I'm just kidding. Yeah. I love BA. Tr- no, Tr- BA is amazing. I no, love it. Great. Uh, no. Before we before we let you go, I have a couple of quick questions. The worst celebration you've ever been a part of, like when you just got trashed with Gatorade, ruined one of your fancy dresses you wear. Yesterday was it yesterday? Uh, and then and then second of all, you grew up in Indiana, so are you a Bears fan? Because you did work for the Packers in Green Bay. So are you a Colts, Colts. fan, Bears fan? It's okay. it's a rough life that we are living currently and have been living for the last seven years as Colts fans. Yeah, Colts fan, IU basketball Wait. fan, big college basketball fan. Grew up a, what was that? What was that? That was that? a, a wham. I am a Bears fan. Seven years is your your bad stretch. Yeah, yours is a lot longer. <laughs> <Wham>. <laughs> that's no, that's no fun. And worst that's celebration? Worst celebration you've been a part of where you had to just get your dress, you just threw your dress away. Oh, it was 2019. Oh, my God. This was rough. It was uh, 2019. They um, won the wild card game in Oakland. And the guys just absolutely 
I mean, it was like their goal to ruin my outfit, to totally ruin everything, all my makeup, everything. I was drenched. And in Oakland, there's no place for like a female to change or to do anything. I had to get on the plane with the team and fly to Houston directly after that celebration with crusty champagne hair and my clothes still smelling. It was the most disgusting I have ever looked or felt in my life. And I had to get on the team plane and the guys like literally, it was like the most entertaining thing that they had ever seen because I'm walking onto the plane looking like a total train wreck um, after they won the wild card game. And they all got to shower and get all nice and fresh in their outfits. And I'm walking on the plane looking like a wet dog. It was, it was horrific. And then she ran into me in the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's probably why we got into such a debate. I was so pissed uh, off. <laughs> don't worry, Trisha. Oakland will fix that whole situation where they, they don't have enough room there in the ballpark. They will fix we'll, that in Las Vegas for you. They will fix Yeah, that we'll, I'll <laughs> wait with bated breath for that. <laughs> they will not fix it in Oakland. Trisha, this was awesome. Hope you had fun. This is what we did. I had a blast. <laughs> I had a blast even with AJ. Thanks, guys. Trisha, I'll, say, I'll tell Steve you said hi. Uncle Steve, you said hi. Oh, good. I was hoping you would. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> Cheers. Who's Uncle Steve? So her uncle, Steve Whitaker, yeah. is the school my kids go to, the headmaster. No way. Yeah, so that's is how we know each other. Like, um, like the, the dean. It would be like the dean. Superintendent. Like the highest level thing you can have. Yeah. For public know. schools in my area, we call it superintendent. Like above principal. Yeah, all above that. all that. Yeah. Superintendent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's how we kind of have a little bit of a connection. That's how we became kind of friends that was, that when we see stuff. each other, which is like once every four years. You might see her more frequently now because she's on the road a lot for national. Yeah, no, I know. So. No, she's great. She's great. That was fun. Well, the Rays are going to lose tonight with an opener. <laughs> they do. <laughs> they play the Red Sox too. They're right? losing tonight. Okay. Wow. So Who's that, with me? Is that, is that your, your prediction? Lock? No, that's not my lock. That's um, my lock to win. I'm riding the Rays till they lose. All right, boys. Really? Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. Um, let's, let's run through the injury report right now. And actually on that front, Adam Duvall is absolutely roaring through the league at the moment. I think he was player of the week in the AL in the first week of the season. And he's just an underrated ball player in my mind for years, really good out there defensively, uh, good for, if he plays regularly, a, a decent home run to uh, total, but, um, a diving catch attempt hurt his wrist. That's the same wrist that he had surgery on. Last year, I don't think there's any updates yet, but maybe we'll get one at some point today. That would suck. Because first of all, the Red Sox need some, they need to have a healthy year to even be 500 in my mind. So he's looking like a top three player on the team right now. Um, so hopefully Adam Duvall's okay. Yeah, it sucks. Especially the one he just had surgery on. Yeah. Because was it two years ago when the Braves won the World Series, he led the league in RBIs? And I bet you nobody could have told you that. Nope. So he was a big part of the Braves winning the World Series. Then last year he was hurt, and the Braves missed him. And now at the Red Sox, they're going to need him. He was having a great year. He was off to a great start. I think he was leading the league in RBIs again, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah. So I mean, well, he's yeah, a huge, too. he's a huge offensive part of any team he's on, and sneaky good home run hitter. Yeah, I saw a stat. He has like he's like fifth in home runs since like 2008, and home runs and defensive runs saved. Something, some stat. I wish I knew the stat better. He, this is a guy that went down to the minor leagues, too, and hit a bunch of dingers after he had already been in the big leagues and got traded, and he's really very underrated, and this is going to be a huge loss for their socks. Yeah, I, I hope uh, it's nothing serious there, and that's just day-to-day -day for him. Great ball player. One more injury to run through here, Andres Munoz who was probably a top five reliever in the bigs last year, just because he yeah. wasn't closing out games all the time. He did have some saves, but he was splitting um, the closer role with Paul Seawald. Last year, led in reliever strikeouts. He's on the IL, 15-day right deltoid strain for him. And for Seattle, they're off to a slow start. Shoulders are bad, too. Shoulders Shoulders for pitchers worst. are bad. Elbows, okay. Shoulders, you get into the shoulders. That's when, it, that's when things are, are not good. And we had Seawald on here, Paul. We asked if he's the closer. Well, guess what, Paul? You're the closer now. There's no more. We're going to, we're going to another guy. You're, guess what, Paul? Paul? You're you're closing now, buddy. So <laughs> get those same numbers up. Kip, where did you have the AL West? We all sent in our predictions. I know you did yours too. So right now, it's, besides Oakland, they suck. But it's flipped upside down. It's Houston and Seattle at four and six. I mean, they're all pretty close. And the Angels and the Rangers are five and four atop the division. 
Seattle fans are already kind of freaking out. I'm like, they're fine. They they look good to me. I mean, this sucks though for their bullpen, but it's a pretty good team in my mind. It's a pretty good team. I think I had them as like the maybe the third wild card, but I had Houston probably running away with it again. Do you still feel that way, or do you think that it could be? Well, I think so. I think it's the one thing about a, a major league season is it's long enough to where there's enough games to separate yourself, where the good teams will end up kind of near the top. With that many games, it's hard to fool somebody for the uh, 162 games. So I think Houston comes out on top. I think Seattle's good enough to get in as the wild card again. You had them as a wild card team, Kratzy, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were my – they were one of my three. I'm not sure where I had them, but I think – I just think I just think their bullpen is so – you talk about later in the season what Kip said about, like, uh, you know, season's long enough, you can't fool guys. That bullpen is – is ridiculous and i think some of their starting pitching is is really good too and when you have depth in the bullpen now don't be wrong the white Sox tricked me last year like i thought their depth in the bullpen was awesome and they blew it but they got more going on there than i think the mariners i think they just they nobody can lose their closure nobody can lose what do you have like 98 strikeouts and 62 appearances like that is a bunch of tickets and but these guys, they just keep running guys out there, and it's it. They're going to be a force. They're not. They're not going to roll over for Houston. That's for sure. But I think Houston still has it. I had the Mariners. I know you did. With You're the, the only division. person on earth that did that. I'm the only person on earth. It's not that far. <laughs> on this show. On this show. Yeah. On the it's East not Coast. That far fetched. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You wouldn't be shocked if the Mariners win the division, would you? Yes. You would be shocked. Yes. Like, I can't believe I'm looking at this division standings board right now. Yes. Wow. Because okay. the Astros are good. Yeah. Really good. I know they're off to a bad start. But they did have to play the White Sox the first four games. <laughs> said nobody. Yeah, said nobody ever. <laughs> said nobody except Scott Braun. And no. hey, they were all healthy at the start of the year. They're they were already the starting to drop. On, on the Astros train. I mean, on the White Sox train. Susan Waldman said they're the best team she, like, she's ever the seen. The Astros. I'm saying you're, you're oh. on the White Sox train. Yeah. I mean, I kind of have to be. He has don't to have be. To be. No, people trust you with I think neutral analysis. Let's move on. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move to uh, minor league baseball. So, story of the weekend from the minors, the Angels affiliate, the Trash Pandas. Which is uh, a trash. A what a trash name. name. Trash name. Is it a trash name? Yeah. Well, they played a trash game. They, <laughs> <laughs> they lost 7-5 despite allowing um, – for the podcast audience that's just listening right now, can you clarify my – I don't have my glasses, so I can't see how many hits. Did uh, they that's allow? a zero. That's zero. a no hitter, by the way. Is and they gave no up. Hitter? No. Yeah. You have to win or no? It's and still a no hitter. Right. It's but no they hitter. gave up seven. How do you give up seven runs and not give up a hit? And it was a, it was a seven inning game. I will say too. I was oh, that's even worse. And I'm like, wait. And it was a it's minor league game is a double header seven inning game. But they were up three nothing heading to the seventh. Five walks, four hit by pitch in a row. And one reaches via error. What? That was the drop in the outfield, right? Fly yeah. ball, yeah. Fly yeah. ball, yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of runs to let up. On usually, if you hitter. usually you lose a like Andy Hawkins, right? He lost a one hit. He lost a no hitter. I think he was the last guy to lose it. Uh, one nothing or something, it, you know. But one nothing, okay. I understand. Guy gets on by an error. They bunt him over, sack fly, something like that. Your team doesn't score. But to give up seven in a no hitter, <laughs> that's just bad pitching. It was bad. It was bad. You need to go back and watch the video of it. And I think he'll be a big league pitcher soon because he throws a billion. But it was a situation. Ben Joyce was out there. Fortunately, he wasn't one of the guys hitting guys. Yeah. He was the guy that was walking. It was like walk, walk, fly ball dropped. They switched pitchers. And it was all of Ben <laughs> Joyce's runs. I think Ben Joyce gave up like five runs all season last year. He gave up five in seven batters last last week it was whatever weekend he did it it was it was bad and then it was just hit batter hit batter. <laughs> i mean if there is ever a minor league game that was a minor league game hell yeah hey let's bring in our next guest i'll ask him about it see he didn't play he, in the minor leagues long enough the next guy no that's true how many games not many we'll ask him nico horner star of the chicago cubs joining us right now oh see that's a backdrop you yeah, like right? that backdrop that's no, I, I mean, me personally, no. No, but I'm saying <laughs> – well, thank you. We know where, uh, where your uh, fandom resides. But, Nico, hey, great to have you on, um, and we're making fun of it in a good way because 
they keep saying Eric Kratz looks like he's in a prison cell or something right now. And you've got like <laughs> absolutely pristine connection, the great Cubs backdrop behind you. Um, did you see, uh, how you doing? Thanks for coming on. Did you hear about that? That no hitter in the minor league game um, where the trash pandas gave up a billion runs. Yeah. Yeah. I heard about it. I think that'd be a, definitely a funny game, like post game on the winning or losing side, just kind of come back to the locker room, just look around like what, what just happened. I mean, everyone in the entire locker room had an offer, but you also won like, just kind of a funny energy. I'd imagine. <laughs> Nico, you got uh hi buddy, first off. I miss you. Secondly, uh you're one of the few leftover guys kind of over the the turnover of the Cubs over the last couple seasons about you and Hap and uh a few others. What's uh what's the clubhouse like these days? How's the the camaraderie and how are the guys meshing together with all the new faces? Yeah, I mean it was definitely an an important spring for us just with as many new people as as we've had. Um I think one of the, the coolest things about the guys that we've brought in this year is there's a lot of guys that have won the World Series. You know, you have you have a lot of champions from different places coming in here and um, at different points in their careers and things like that, obviously. But to have guys that have actually done it, I think is pretty significant and um, really high character guys. And uh, it's been a fun group already and really looking forward to it. What do each of those guys bring? Like, what does what does Dansby bring besides 100 hits in the first series? <laughs> what does what does Dansby bring, Dansby bring that Cody doesn't bring? Or like you know they yes they got their World Series rings, but like what do each of them bring? Like those two guys specifically. Um, yeah, I mean I, I think I think that they're you know they're at different points in their careers. Obviously, Dansby has has just signed a a, a huge free agent deal, and then and then Cody's on a on a one year deal, and so those are differences right there. But both come with um, a lot of a lot of motivation, and I think they're both at a place where they're in a good place to be the best versions of themselves. I think the nice thing about the guys that have come in is that they don't. It doesn't feel like anyone has to be other there anything other than what they've done their whole careers, which is uh, just be the best version of themselves. And I think we got a staff that that really makes that possible. I mean, they're both uh, they're very different guys, but. Um, Dansby's been incredible to watch, especially on the defensive side, just how easy that he makes the game look. And Cody as well, and playing up the middle with both those guys is a, is a pretty special thing for sure. Are you, are you pissed at Dansby? Did you tell Dansby, look, dog, like, I was the shortstop. I'm going to let you play short, but if you suck, I'm going to take your spot. <laughs> like, did you have no. that discussion yet? <laughs> I haven't I haven't had it yet. You think that that'd be a good go to though at this point? Like I probably should it probably should have done it with an introduction, right? First thing, but maybe I have it now, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can go to it now. You can definitely go to it now because now he's feeling comfortable. He feels good. Like he's like, ah, two for four, what's the score? You yeah. go up to him and be like, Look, one, you gotta pay for all of my meals because you're making more than I am, even though hey, congrats, you got a nice little extension. I like that for you. Good for you. Thank you. But Two, yeah, you gotta you gotta set. That's how you that's how you know where you stand in a clubhouse. You don't have to punch somebody in the face, but you gotta you know you gotta make sure you still got street cred. And you're like, look, I was the guy last year. You can be the guy for a little bit, but no, I'm looming. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll pick my spot. I'll feel it out. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Listen, I got I got to work with Nico uh, in the 2020 season uh, at second base a bunch. I think we would pick each other's brains. I think I would try to help him and by the end of the ground ball session i was like oh i think he's doing it right i think he's doing it better than i am actually um moving back to second now are you getting more comfortable seeing your name in the lineup every more you're not kind of in and out of it it's nice to be there every day you can find a little rhythm you have a routine you're getting ready for every game knowing you're probably in there is that have you seen the difference definitely i mean last year was the the most extended stretch of baseball I've ever played and and you know, I know anyone who's played this game at this level knows that like you don't really have a sense of what it is until you've done the full 162 six months of playing every day and so I definitely feel like just as a player in general regardless of position I got a better sense of what that actually means now and um and playing second base I mean I've played more short in my life but I played enough second that the, it doesn't feel like a big adjustment but um I like that there's no more shifts. I think it brings out a lot of the best qualities of infielders. I think uh, the game's in a good place with that. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling good over there. So you remember all the important stuff I told you, right, that I yes. taught you? Yes. It's, okay, good. good. <laughs> I'm so lucky sure. to have 
veterans like you. <laughs> hey, hey Nico, you, you had you had twenty. Did I get this right? You had twenty bags last year. Yeah. With the new with the new rules and the new bases. First, I want to know which affects it more. The four and a half inches is that huge, and is it the new bases or is it the or or is it the disengagements that are going to have you have thirty nine bases this year? That's a good number. Um, I, I think the disengagements. I think uh, pitchers can be pretty binded by that. They use a pickoff early in a early in an at bat, and it you know it's an advantage for the runner and definitely going to take advantage of that you know maybe i'm thrown out by four and a half inches a couple times in the past and i won't be this year but when i'm on base i'm not thinking about that i'm thinking more about the the disengagements and um yeah i think it'll be pretty fun nico did you get a congratulations text from jason kipnis when you signed your extension and did he give you any advice on how you should celebrate <laughs> i don't think i I don't think I got a text from him, um, but he gets a lot of different texts from me for that on different <laughs> things. Yeah, uh, I think you know, definitely was lucky to play around a lot of guys who had been through like the financial side of baseball in a lot of different ways in their careers when I was younger, and just like seeing guys play in a free agent year or a platform year or guys who've signed extensions or things like that. And there's, there's no like right way to do it within all that. I think you just, it is interesting though, seeing, having seen other guys been through different situations and then you just make the best choice for yourself that you can. And, and you go from there and um, I feel good about where I'm at. Did You're, you, Nico, you live where in Chicago? Just the neighborhood? Uh, Wicker park area. Generally. Okay. Great. Okay. That's a good area. I was just up there this weekend. It was freezing. You're, at, you're I'm, I'm guessing you're at Wrigley right now. Yes, I am. What, what is it like to play in that hellhole every day? Please <laughs> tell me. Because they loved me every time I went to Wrigley. Nothing yeah. but a standing ovation. Uh, absolutely. So being a Cali kid, you're in Chicago. It's freezing. What's it like to, to, to walk out? Listen, I love going to Wrigley because when you walked out, it was great. I mean, you walked out, you see the scoreboard, you see the whole deal. You look at, you used to be able to see the whole city kind of behind the – so what's it like when you take the field every day? Did you, did you grow up – growing up in Cali on WGN, did you say, man, if I ever get to walk out on Wrigley, what's going to be like? Now you get to do it every day? Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up an A's fan, um, and I did go to the Coliseum a lot, and it – I appreciate it, but it's very different. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think. I mean, they have running water at Wrigley, so that's a start. <laughs> Take the positives, right? Yeah. No, <laughs> we, dude, playing here is is ridiculous. We're we're so spoiled. Um, you guys have heard that before, but um, and it hasn't even been that cold so far this year, so that's been been huge. But um, no, it's it, we're we're so lucky. I mean, it's just it's hopefully something I never get used to, and the kind of thing that like whether it's in the middle of August or early April, like there's always going to be an energy there. And if you're not, if you're not feeling like excited and grateful to be in the show playing here, like it's not going to happen anywhere. I don't think so. Feeling very lucky to be here for sure. When, when you wake up, do you check the flags? I, I know when I was going to Raymond, <laughs> yeah. driving up Lakeshore, first yeah, thing you do is which I, way is uh, the water going? Cause I would tell you if it's blowing in or out. Oh, you can definitely get caught up in the wind traps. I mean, we're probably won't see the flags doing much but blowing in or blowing across the left probably till like july or so but um man it's a it's a beast it can be the best place in the world to hit or the worst uh and sometimes in between but it's usually one of those two and so <laughs> you just hope that you know over the course of the year it ends up ends up even and out pretty well and things will be all right but wrigley uh, yeah, for, wrigley yeah wrigley, man you never know <laughs> There's been a there's been some serious warning track balls already, and you see guys in the game just looking looking up at the sky like what just happened. And you know Texas comes in, they play in a dome, and then you know come here and it's like what are all these elements and what's going on? And it's a uh, they have a good lineup. I mean it was it's a different beast. Who who I talked to people that played in L.A. and people that played in Chicago for an entire year, and they talk about the celebrities in L.A. And they say it's nothing like the celebrities that come in at in Chicago. So who is the biggest celebrity or who you were like, dang, 
I, yeah. I can't believe I'm meeting that person. Conor, Conor McGregor, when he walked through, um, was uh, he had like a, a different kind of presence for sure. I feel like his he had like the most like perfectly tailored suit I've ever seen before. I think <laughs> he just like and the way just the way he carried himself. And he was actually he was injured at the time I think because he had a cane. Um, I think I had hurt his ankle recently. Um, but he just the way he carried himself, the the size of the group he had with him. Like I'd never said anything like that, and I just kind of just watched him go by. And it was a you know I'm getting doing whatever getting ready for the game and he just kind of walks by you're like oh like <laughs> that's different but um you know i think part of it is i i was here at the tail end of uh those winning teams here but it's different when the team is winning here and so i think that's something you kind of earn too with the, the energy and the people around the clubhouse and things like that so you know hopefully we're back to a level of excitement where that's drawing people in too nico the, the correct answer to that question was david ross yeah, dancing with the star. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> that was one of uh, the one of the things that I regret most that I didn't get to do in 2020. It was the lockout, or I'm sorry, it was the COVID year. So I got to play their hometown. It's where I'm from, and not yeah. one fan in this in the stadium. So empty stadiums. The good trade off was the scrimmages we got to do for that spring training 2.0. You're playing in like a dead quiet Chicago city, but you're scrimmaging at Wrigley. It was pretty awesome well man there, there were some things from that whole year that just like it just yeah, doesn't you just roll with the punches real. well i mean I, I think a moment lost in all of that it, it was pretty sad actually but funny too is when we went back to to cleveland and you tip your hat to the end the <laughs> stadium and it's it's like man you put so much time in there you won so much and just it, it would have been awesome to, to have that moment you handled it well but god that. I would have loved to have seen that. And See why I love this guy? Yeah. It's good. Him no, and, so we had a little – we would always hit together, me and Nico, to give people the backstory. Uh, and Jake Cronenworth on the Padres. So we had our little second base university going. And uh, you guys know what a big fan I am of both of you. And congratulations again on those extensions to each of you. We They're asking me here what kind of nickname you got. And I wanted to do pipes. I wanted to try to get the video <laughs> of you crushing the cages that we couldn't hit there anymore. Do you have a nickname yet? Has anybody given you one there? Dude, I don't really – I mean, Nico is technically a nickname. My name's Nicholas. But, I mean, some people call me Neek, but that's about it. I've never really had a nickname. That's not a – maybe I need to – It's just too smooth. You just, you just got – we got to get you one here down the road. I earned something along the way. I know. They've been trying, to been trying to figure out, like, a, something for Dansby and, and me, but, I don't know. Things take time. It's all good. Kind of on your side. He had a he had a recommendation, didn't he? Pipes, I thought. Pipes. Pipes. I he so the backstory is he just crushed one of the pipes above our cage and flooded the entire place and we all had to kind of abandon ship and we probably did the most worst job of trying to soak up any of the water that was coming out. Yeah. It, Basically it, putting it, paper towels down. It, we flood. thought it was a, a sprinkler at first. <laughs> dripping down but it was an entire pipe system which is probably sewage and uh <laughs> the, the whole place had about you know three or four inches of water across the entire surface by the end of it and we started out like dabbing it with paper towel <laughs> <laughs> we just said hey noel we'll see you next week come you, you got this yeah. we're out of here that was the last hey, one hey yeah. kip when you go to stanford you don't get you don't get nicknames when you go to asu you need nicknames but at stanford we're like we're too smart we don't do nicknames <laughs> well, and they don't yeah. know how to clean up we, we go by our proper name only our proper it, yeah asu names. we can't we can't remember the full names yeah that's why you got <laughs> nicknames hey he's getting there he's getting there he's gonna get one hey Maybe. Nico, what's what's your walk-up song this year um i have a I kept one of them from last year. It's Tequila Shots by Kid Cudi. And then the the other one I'm using is called 4 a.m. Bay Bridge Music by Andre Nicotina. So, so you, what what's the balance? How do you decide which one to use when? Is it for first two at-bats, second two? Yeah, yeah. Alternate at-bats. Um, I've, I've gone up as high as four, so kind of one at, an at-bat for the game. That was a little much, um, but I probably won't switch too much. Honestly, like I don't really mix up that much. You see, guys go through a lot, um, but I kind of kind of keep it as is. Yeah. Are you pissed when you're like, all right, now they played tequila shots last time? You're like, 
dang it, I don't get any hits when I get this. Like, maybe they can play tequila shots again. Like, are you are no, you thinking I mean, that in your head? We we I mean, as hitters, we've all been through our our superstitions and, and craziness. Of course, I I they're really inconvenient. I try and stay away from them. Uh, as far as you know, same batting gloves, same bat, all of, all of those things. I try as best I can. I'm obviously aware of all those things, like all of us are, but. Um, I do my best to avoid those, so try not to associate that too much. <laughs> Wait, so Nico, this is how old I am. I was there at the first game. They allowed walk up music for the Cubs. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. White yeah. Sox. I'll Jesus. never forget. Ryan Terrio so was long. so pumped because it used to just be organ music. Yeah. So they put do do do. So we're playing the Cubs, and Ryan Terrio, I think, was leading off, and he comes up, and it was like Taylor Swift, or I don't know what it was, <laughs> and he was so excited. I'm like, dude, why are you so happy? He's like. We get walk up songs now. Yeah. The big finally. leagues. Yeah, he's like, finally. <laughs> and then you guys have the full club in your clubhouse now. I mean, your locker room looks like a club. So uh, it's, it's perfect. It's, yeah, it's funny when people, I mean, people come here for the first time, uh, new players, and it's kind of like a, it's a bit of a maze. It's a circular maze of sorts. And guys, you can see they're trying to play it cool, but they really have no idea where they are or what direction the field is or the cafeteria or anything. And you kind of see a couple laps, and then they kind of orient themselves and figure it out. But it's a, yeah, we get, we're we're pretty spoiled here. We got a good. You keep living the good life, Nico. Enjoy yeah. it. We'll get you a nickname by next time. Kip's yeah, first day I'm here open. on the show, so he's working on it. He's open to it, Kip. So it's yeah. on you, man. <laughs> Call up your ASU, buddy. So let's it. get it going. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Nico. Good luck yeah, to you, man. Later, buddy. Thank you. Cheers. Appreciate it. You, Kip, we got to get our best uh, our best people on this. I like well, pipes. I did, but does he have pipes? He's got to have do pipes. You? No, he's a strong he's a strong kid. He is strong. So he is. I think it's fine. I like pipes. I was hoping when he said pipes, he would like roll his sleeves up. We could see him. And then he would have been like Scotty Brom. Like, I was going to say, pipes? Scotty's might be pipes before Nico's. What about what about Horny? Can you not call him Horny? <laughs> you can't. Why didn't you ask him that on the interview? Because you guys are like that one broadcaster. You guys take half the game, and then I come in at the end. Well, that's because we don't know when the people that have you trapped will allow you to speak. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you like the first ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. Kratzy, come on. I mean, there's been three times now where Scott's mic's crapped out. You okay. could have talked whatever Thank you me. wanted to say. The oh, ransom's at like thirty bucks now. Why? <laughs> it's gone down. <laughs> it keeps going down. They want a Wawa gift card. A what? Wawa. Oh, Wawa. Wawa gift card. I was like, a what? <laughs> That's Wawa. why I'm here, so I can help clarify things for you. Yeah. AJ's getting old. He can't hear you too well. I got you. All right. BetMGM, uh, we'll do our picks in a little bit, but they put out um, a question today, um, 134 Eastern. So actually, it was pretty recently. Which player's batting stance did you imitate the most? as a kid so i feel like we've got a pretty good crew on here to ask that question to and also if you have a bat nearby and you want to show us something great aj you might have to move i'm tethered i can't grab get one i don't have to move we can get you i got long arms. there you go okay so Wait, let me get the black one why don't you start for us dude listen i grew up in the early 90s i was in high school the man was ken griffey jr so i was all like Right in high school, and then I got to the pros, and they were like, "Yeah, it's not going to work. That only works for one guy, so we're going to change it." Who told you that? The hitting coach for the, the hitting coordinator for the Twins. He said, "Ditch the Griffey thing." Yeah, it's like it's too long. Only one guy can do that, and he was right. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up being pretty good. Did you imitate anyone else after that, or you just created your own? No, then I just tried my own mm. stuff. Most vanilla left-handed swing ever. Two thousand hits. You're bad. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Just stuck with Griffey. People would remember me. <laughs> they would have remembered you. I don't know if it would have worked, though. True, that's true. Might not I mean, have been two thousand hits. No, that's true. No, yeah, that was, but I, but so I was a little bit different. I, but I was Griffey like this, and then I would before I would swing, I would kind of tap my shoulder. So I would that was kind of my load. I was like that in high school, and then I'd go from there. Mm -hmm. But then as I got older, I kind of was real lazy and kind of like Kipnis would be like, <laughs> Kip, you, let let's see yours, and then also who you mimicked. I mimicked. I had the Tommy bat point at the pitcher in like high school, kind of, and early days of college. I think then along the AJ's lines, I got a little bit lazier because it just got too heavy to hold it there the whole time. So I went down to the little kind of a uh, Lance Berkman wiggle below, kind of between the legs, and then brought it up, kind of Berkman McGuire ish, kind of just like where you're rocking it down by your shins. 
Or then once they get set, you bring it back up. I don't have a bat around me or the space, but. Wait, you're telling me that you had like a, you, when you played, you kind of went to a. This is like growing up. He's saying when growing oh, up. When oh, I, growing up, you switched. I didn't okay, do, okay. I didn't do the, the point back at the catcher umpire till like high eight. Yeah, I remember. I played the first time I ever played against Kipnis was in AAA. I was with uh, Indy, and he was in Columbus, and he did the he did the bat straight back thing. And I remember, like, I have, I have never really seen that. Mickey Tettleton. Well, yeah. right, but my mind's like, it's kind of cool and unique. Like, I wonder if it's like he's really doing it. And it's... one of the guys on my team, Brian Bixler, goes. Brian Bixler was a shortstop with Indy. He goes, hey, he goes, you won't touch his bat. And <laughs> that One of my is, biggest fears. That was something – I touched his bat, and Bixler thought it was the funniest thing ever. <laughs> the next day we played again, I go, Bix, I go, I'll smell the bat next time. And I put my mask – I put my mask right up to it, and it bumped the bat, and Kip goes – He's like this. He's like, I mean, locked in. He's locked in. He goes, oh, oh. Yeah. he goes, so, sorry, did I get you? Like his bat would <laughs> sit still, and he thought I, he thought he hit my face. It was it's like, hilarious. I was, I was, was loving it because I was like, it, it was almost embarrassing at first. I, like it started with uh, as like a drill in the cage, and then it was, I was like, all right, I'm gonna try this in a game because it was working. Ended up working out great, but then I was like. Anybody who wanted to quick pitch me or something could do it probably while I'm trying to find it right here. And then I just always feared about just like poking you guys in the face or anything. So that's a great first introduction to that's how playing against Eric Kratz is, what he does to screw with you. First time meeting him. <laughs> yeah, people call me an asshole. I never did any of that Kratz stuff. That's incredible. <laughs> Almost, at least once a week, there is a story like, you won't do this. And yeah. Kratz is like, like, I'll do it all. I'll do it. I got, I got low standards, man. <laughs> low standards. I'll pay you a dollar to do this. Okay, I'll do it twice. <laughs> 20 bucks is 20 bucks. <laughs> 20 bucks. Wait, that was kid, you didn't know that he was trolling to... you? I got... I no, enabled. no, because I'm, I mean, I'm locked in on the pitcher, and I thought I just honestly hit him in the face with my bat, but he's just <laughs> booping himself pretty much. It, hey, it worked too. I think I was screwed up a little bit. One of my other favorites. One of my other favorites was a lot of the Cuban guys would spray a lot of champagne. Champagne. They would spray <laughs> a lot of cologne on their body. And I played with a Cuban guy, and I knew he, I knew he sprayed the bottom of his cleats before each game. Like he would spray his whole body. I mean, they smelled delicious. Wait, he and sprayed his cleats? Sprayed the bottom of his cleats. Yeah. So his first at bat, I told I told our shortstop, I told our shortstop in in Lehigh Valley, Brian Bocock. I said, I said, Bocock, I said, I'm gonna smell this guy's cleats. First at bat, he goes, no chance. I said, hey, dime, dime, hey, tus zapatos, vamos, vamos. He goes, what? Your ganchos, your ganchos, your cleats. He put his cleat up, and I went, yep, still good. Do I would do that with Prince Fielder. He would have a new cologne on every time. If I got to first base, I'd just bury my head in his chest and see what he was working with that day. Smell delicious. Yeah. AJ <laughs> Space during this whole thing. You didn't experience any of that stuff? Yeah. I, I experienced a lot of guys that smelled like perfume. Right. And I was just trying to get them out of there as fast <laughs> as possible. <laughs> AJ would curse at the batter. There was AJ, AJ. Especially Kipnis because he used to kill us. Uh, not with perfume. Him. Not with perfume, no, with, with hits. Gosh, he come to Chicago. Kip would crush you guys? Oh, dude, he come to Chicago in three games. It was like eight hits guaranteed, one homer, a couple of triples. Who was he getting? Who Everybody. Pitches? Didn't matter. Everyone? Yeah, didn't matter. He knows I would, it, too. Look I would – I would, uh, my back would hurt when Chris Sale would pitch, so I would take that one game off and uh, be, <laughs> be, be rested for the other three righties. <laughs> a stiff Sale back. Yeah. Yeah. With, with that – Team oriented because you're not the only one to you know suddenly have a little one day issue when Chris Sale would pitch in his prime. Was that team oriented or would players sometimes be like, "Hey Skip, if you're gonna give me a day off this week, Tuesday sounds great when it, Sale's pitching." It turned into that, so it's kind of a little bit of both. Tito would have a good feel with Cleveland. Uh, 
he would come to me and be like, do you need a day? And I would actually go look, be like, are his White Sox, I thought they were coming up and they'd be the next week. I'd be like, I'll make it till Wednesday. And he knew exactly why I picked Wednesday. And uh, fortunately, we had like guys like Ryan Rayburn. And oh, some gosh. Of these other, see, see. Some why you got to bring guys, him up? <laughs> some of these other guys probably played in the big leagues. No offense to Rayburn, but played in the big leagues like four extra years of what they could do against Chris Sale. Like these guys were built just for Chris Sale. True. Did Ryan Rayburn so, crush the White Sox? Oh, he, we we kept him in the big leagues for like four extra years. <laughs> <See>? <laughs> I'm serious. Between Detroit, Detroit, yep, Detroit and Cleveland. Oh my gosh, and his uh, he'd be nasty yeah. versus some tough lefties. Yeah, uh, he had the Jason Aldean song that he always came out to. Uh, oh my gosh, I forget. But he had I'm a, not a country guy. I, don't I know. know. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head. But he always had that song, Jason. Aldean, and every time I heard it, I'm like, oh shit, <laughs> here he comes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, incredible. Well, anyway, good. That that was a lot more than I expected to be imitating a beast during a kid. But um, thank you, BetMGM, for the question. And guess what? We have our next guest ready to go. Arizona Diamondbacks Josh Rojas joining us right now after a big weekend for the D-backs. And great, great uh, show hair going on for us yeah. right now as well. I knew the guys were going to look at that right away and be like, let's go. You didn't the have to comb your hair curls. for us? No, no. I love it. Josh, how you doing off a big weekend? Um, thanks for joining us, man. What's new? Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, this is, this is cool. Appreciate you. Well, first off, tell me about the weekend. I know you had a good quote, too. Um, you said, I think the biggest thing is we were putting the pressure on. Felt like it was the first time I've ever played the Dodgers where it felt like they could feel the pressure. So last year, I won't go specific numbers, the Dodgers had your number. This year... Is it five and one already? The D backs against the Dodgers? Uh I believe they won five, they, right? Uh, yeah, five. Um they won three. They won three this year already. Right. I think uh yeah, so uh, they won two I in LA, one one at home. One at home. Okay. So tell me what the difference is so far. You gave me you gave us that quote. What's different? Is it the way that you're approaching them? Is it the roster construction of the Diamondbacks this year? Yeah, I think it's I think it's roster construction for sure. Um, I we I mean speed kills and uh, we we used it to our advantage. I think the tough part in LA is we couldn't get on, guys on base, and you don't get on base, you can't really use your speed um, against them. So they came to our place, we got on base, we were putting the pressure on, stealing bases, um, taking extra bases, scoring on base hits. Uh, I mean, like you, like you pointed out in that quote, it, it really felt like they could feel pressure. And, and that's a, that's really the first time I've, I've, uh, been on the right side of that. That's hey, going to be a great a statistician. What do you got? No, they're five and three against the five, Dodgers. I can't believe they played them eight, eight times, times already. already. I know that is kind of crazy. <laughs> well, that's awesome. That's gotta be a great feeling. Cause you guys are a young team. So did you guys yeah. go into the season saying, Hey, we played the Dodgers eight times in the first two weeks of the season, we really have to focus on them because they've been the king of the division for the last 10 years. Did Tori Lovello come to you guys and say, hey, we need to focus on these games because we don't want to get too far behind or early like we have in the past? Yeah, I think, I mean, even in spring training, we knew who we were opening up against. We knew we had uh, Dodgers and Padres to start off the, the, the season. And it was, we were kind of preparing for them all through spring training and just, you know, this is how we want to play. Um, you know, these are the things we want to do when we're on the bases. These are the things we're going to do on defense and neutralize them taking extra bases, you know, cause they can swing it. You know, their offense is, is just so scary. They can put three, four runs on the board, you know, with a couple mistakes. Um, so you, we knew that we were going to have to chip away. You know, we, we beat them with the long ball two times out of those five wins and the rest, we were just scrappy putting the ball in play, not just not striking out, being aggressive. Um, you know, we even against the Padres, um, you know, the first and third play that, that we ran were, you know, I get credited with the steal of home and it's cool and everybody thinks, you know, oh, you stole home, that's awesome. But that was actually something we were talking about in spring training. Um, we have four or five different variations of first and third plays, and, and that was just one of them. So we, we prepared during spring training to beat – teams with aggressiveness and with speed and uh it came out and and it worked for us uh, against uh san diego 
for one game and uh, then in L.A. here at home. Would you rather be five and three versus the Dodgers or nine and zero oh like the Rays versus the Detroit Tigers than some of these other teams? <laughs> I think. Oh man, yeah, you honestly. know, you know, I'd I'd love a nine and zero, oh, but I would I would much rather uh, against you know our division rivals and some powerhouses in the league for sure. You're chop, you're, if you're if you're chopping down the the Giants in your division, that that gets you guys feeling good right there. I remember some of the toughest teams I played against was people who put the most pressure on the base pass, the the 2015 Royals and some of these other guys where it's like we can't let one guy on because if we do, you already first base already feels like second base to us. Is that what you guys got going? Yeah, that, it felt, you know, the first time I felt that was playing the Guardians last year. Uh they were just they don't strike out. They, it's like the most defeating feeling is when a team just is averaging an exit below of 70 miles an hour and it's just hit after hit after hit. And then they get on base and it turns into a double because they steal second. And then the next guy just fillets something out there and he scores. It's like the most defeating thing. Like you start looking at each other like, why are we not in the right spots? Are we not making the right pitches? Like, what's going on or like the look on a pitcher's face when you take a good slider just below the zone and, and he's just shaking his head. Like, wh- like, how did he take that? Then they make a mistake with a heater. Um, the guardians were like that last year. And, um, and, and look at the teams they're playing against. They're playing against the Yankee, like power teams and they're winning games. So I think when we got a taste of that being on the other side of it last year, it, it kind of, you know, just fueled us into like, this can win games if, if we, if we just buy in and do it right. Do you think this is a sustainable model? And is this model built by Tori Lovello? Is this model built by Dave McKay? Who's, who's the one that's running those, those base running things? Cause I know what Dave, I know, I know what Dave can do. And, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know Tori as well, just playing against him, but who's, who's running those models and is this sustainable for you guys throughout the year? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's, there's the health factor. Um, you know, if everybody can stay healthy and keep your legs under them, but as far as, you know, who's running, it's a group effort. Um, you know, Mac has ideas, obviously everything runs through Tory. You know, we have a lot of ideas offensively that, you know, we have our hitters meetings before every game, uh, with just the hitters and the hitters coaching coaches. And then we have our base running meeting, which is about five or six guys that, um, you know, are aggressive on the bases and we meet with Mac and then they they run all those ideas through Tory. So, you know, if we ever have a new idea in those meetings and we tell our coaches, our hitting coaches or our or Mac doing base running and we have an idea, um, you know, he'll say, all right, let me run this by Tory and get back to you. And then usually for the most part, Tory's good with it. You know, there's a few instances where, you know, he'll say, all right, well, we're going to be less aggressive in these situations or um you know, Tory has some guidelines that he has set for Mac and Tony on the bases that, you know, we don't know of, but, you know, we'll say like, Hey, you know, can we run right here? And Mac's like, uh, w- this is, you know, this is one of those red light situations. So um, it's not just a free for out there. There are some guidelines and some stipulations that we got to abide by. Um, but for the most part, um, Tory's, you know, he's all in a- on being aggressive. What's one thing that Max taught you in, like that you wish you were, I don't know, maybe a freshman at Hawaii, like, dang, how did I not know that? Because it, for people who don't know, Dave McKay is one of the, he's, he's like the, you know, he's the Rusty Koontz of, of base running too. Rusty was the first base coach that Kip was talking about with our Royals teams that we just ran. Like, it was like, I'll get you five. I'll get you five bags easy yeah. this month. Like, what's the one thing that Dave McKay, because AJ is also a high school coach. He sometimes shows up, but I'm a high school coach. Like, what's the one thing where you're like, dang, go on, and I wish I knew that when I was in high school that he's taught you? Well, I think it's how often pitchers will show you what they're going to do. It's unbelievable. Like, there's some things that Max shows us, and it's like, this guy doesn't know he does that when he's going home <laughs> or when he's coming to first. Like, how does he not, how does he not know that? Um I think that's the biggest thing is like, so there, there's so many tales that guys have. Um, The other thing is counts that guys won't throw over or never have in their whole career thrown over in certain counts. Um, 
which obviously, you know, in high school and, and college, you don't really have access to that information like we do in the big leagues. But, um, you know, things that you could pick up in a regular high school or college game is like, hey, this guy points his toe, you know, in towards the rubber when he's going home and he leaves a little more open when he's going to pick over. It's like little things like that that Mac picks up on and, and then he, he tells you and then you see it and you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go. Um, you know, there's already been times this year where Mac's like, hey, he's, you can get him right here. And I don't go and he's right. It was a curveball in the dirt. And I'm like, ah, I'm sorry, Mac. I, just, I don't want to get thrown out. I, and I didn't, I didn't have full trust in you right there. Um, but you know, he's, he's like, you said, he's the base running guru and you know, he's got, he's got our catcher stealing bases right now. Josh, I want to ask you about, that's a good point. I want to ask you about your rich rookie teammate, Corbin Carroll. So he's a hundred yeah. million dollar man and the, you're a young team. So you don't have many rich dudes in the clubhouse that you can kind of make fun of in a good way. You can't really do that to Bumgarner. I'm sure for obvious reasons, he would, uh, you know, probably find a way to hit you in a sim game or something like that. Uh, but for Corbin, <laughs> this dude is barely in the bigs. We know all the talent that he's got. Is he buying dinners anytime something comes up or you're like, I don't know, dude, you're rich. You figure it out. Yeah, man, we haven't gotten him to buy anything yet. Um, I just found out. I just finally got him to tell me what his signing bonus was a couple days ago. He's just, he's very, I, he doesn't want to be the rich guy. You can tell. He wants to just be the – he kind of likes being, you know, the young rookie, the quiet guy. Um, he's trying to play that underdog role, but it's like, hey, man, you're rich. You, you're going to have to dish out some dish out some meals here soon. Um, <laughs> I'm sure by – you know, I'm sure I'm sure we'll get him soon to, to, to buy something for us. I mean, he still rides to the park with his mom and dad. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's still getting dropped off. Josh, I saw uh, one of your quotes before, and I think it's kind of one of my favorite parts of a player figuring it out, basically. And this is kind of – it stemmed from my whole hold it back thing where you're like, I don't care how it works just as long as it works. So you kind of – you talked about trying to hit home runs a little bit earlier, college on up to through the minors, and now you've kind of gone away from that, and you're like, I just need contact and hit it where it's pitched and gone throughout. Tell us about that like kind of maturation and how you came to that conclusion, basically, where – I just need to do what needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, I think it was getting exposed at the big league level. Um, you know, the pitching was a whole lot different. Um, you know, I came up through the minor leagues just hunting fastballs and hitting mistakes. And, you know, in the minor leagues, you get tons of mistakes. You're going to get fastballs over the plate. Um, you take this, you take the chase spin and you, you'll, you'll earn yourself a heater. And then you get to the big leagues and you're getting 2-0 breakers and you're getting – three, one change-ups and, you know, you're, it's just the heaters, even when you get a heater, it's, you know, we just faced Dustin May the other day and he struck me out on three pitches on heaters over the plate. So, um, you know, it's, it's a whole different level. It's a whole different game. The command's different. The movement's different. Um, the pitch sequencing. So I just came up with an approach of like, okay, you know, I have a high contact rate. Um, I can put the ball in play. I can square it up. It's just a matter of, you know, if I try to do too much, uh, I'm not going to, I'm losing the ability to, to make contact and put the ball in play. And I think my, my, you know, strength in a lineup is, is getting on base and then creating havoc on the bases. And, um, you know, I, I kind of fell in love with the long ball in the minor leagues. Um, I was, I was hitting a ton of them. We went through that, uh, the, the juiced ball era a little bit in, in the minor leagues in, in 19, and, uh, you know, homers were fun. And I, and I, I kind of started to believe myself as a home run hitter. And I, I got to the big leagues and I got exposed a little bit and was rolling over everything and flaring stuff to left. And uh, it kind of humbled me a little bit and brought me back to, to what got me drafted and what got me to the big leagues is, is making contact and hitting line drives. Well, I think it's one thing to get there. It's another thing to stay there that you hear about people. This game usually always makes the adjustment to you. Uh, the people who can make the adjustment back are the ones who end up staying there in the long run. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I've I've had plenty of conversations with guys that have been around a long time and, you know, having Longori now, it's, it's awesome because, you know, he's seen so many different eras. You know, he came up, you know, I think he debuted in 2008 and he was just talking to us the other day about how pitching is so much different now. Like 
you know, guys were, you know, trying to fool you with, with movement and stuff. And, and now it's like guys are attacking you with high heaters plus velo. Um, you know, you've, you've seen it. You've seen the game change over time. Um, the pitching has, has become like a power. Um, you know, guys aren't scared to walk you. They're, they're just trying not to leave the ball over the plate and give up the homer. So that's where you see all this, you know, 3-1 chase pitch, 2-0 chase pitch. Um, you know, you really got to – you you got to be willing to take your walks almost. Like guys guys are okay with walking you, and they don't want to give up the long ball. Josh, you, you, you had a different path to the, to the major leagues than most people. You went to JUCO, right, and then you ended up at the University of Hawaii. Do they still have the banner from the 1997 Honolulu Sharks that we won out there in the Hawaii Winter League? <laughs> I don't think so. I, I never saw it. <laughs> but it, it, was, it was the big one out there in left field. Right field has the, still has the dorms, right, in right field. And then left field, there was more yeah. of a mountain view. Yeah, it was out there in the left field because the dorms, it would, we would have covered up all the dorms in right field. So you must have missed it in left field. Yeah, I, I, must, I must have. They must, it must still be up there. You just can't see it. It's behind yeah. a couple of trees or something. <laughs> I think they covered up the dorms for other reasons, but go ahead. <laughs> explain, yeah. explain the Juco route. Cause a lot of people look and say, Oh, I got to go to Juco. It's, it's, it's not a good thing, but how do you end up from Juco to Hawaii? And then now, obviously now you're in the minor leagues or the major leagues, excuse me. Yeah. Um, it, was, uh, it was, you know, like you said, it was when I first made the decision, it was kind of uh it was kind of a bummer for me mentally just because, you know, you have like the national signing days at, in high school and, you know, people are signing to go here, signing to go there. Um, you know, and I, I considered myself a above average baseball player. And I, and I thought that meant you went to division one or you went to a university. Um, but I was just, you know, when I was, while I was talking to schools and, you know, shopping around, I had a conversation with the, with one of the recruiting guys at U of A and he was like, yeah, you could come here. You know, we'd love to have you. Um, but, you know, looking at our infield, you know, you'd be a, you know, a red shirt guy. And then, you know, you could work in some playing time your sophomore year and then your junior year or your red shirt sophomore year would be like your first real opportunity for playing time. And, you know, and I had seen guys that I had played with that had already graduated, go to universities and, you know, not play the first year and then, you know, fighting for playing time. Every time they mess up, they're out of the lineup their second year. And it was just like, do I, re- uh, you know, I, I can't do it. I can't sit and watch a game. I, I, I have to be in the game. It's just my mentality. Um, I'm not a good bench guy. Um, so I just was having conversations with different people and, and realized that, you know, there's a lot of development that happens in junior college. Um you know, there's no practice rules. You're out there four or five hours every day taking ground balls, hitting, um, playing, you know, fall balls like a full season. There's 35, 40 games in, in the fall. Um, and I just I, – I loved it. And I, I – the, and the reason why I settled on Paris Valley is they had a really good infield coach. They had a hitting guy that I really liked. And, uh, you know, it was, it was all something new, and I felt like I could learn a lot, and, and I did. I, I think I developed – you know, I think that was my biggest development was, you know, my first two years of junior college, just really learning how to play defense for real. And, um, you know, that was the first time that it wasn't just me and my dad hitting the backyard. I had, you know, some new ideas uh, with our with the hitting coach there. and um, He was kind of the first guy that really got me on that idea of just staying on playing with the baseball for as long as possible. It's kind of uh, Kipnis has that that same, you know, that there you that, go you know, level bat. Um, that's when I first started playing with that, that whole idea of just like, well, if I want to be in the zone for as long as possible, why don't I just start there and, uh, and keep it there the whole time. And that's when it first started and, um, it really worked out for me. And then from there I got recruited to go to Hawaii and then, uh, senior year I get drafted. But you, you just, did you just say you wanted to hit like Jason Kipnis? You still want to hit like <laughs> hey, Jason Kipnis? I watched I watched a lot of his videos. I'm not going to lie. My bad. My uh, bad. You know, that's, so that's why we had you on today then. It wasn't because of <laughs> how the right Diamondbacks are doing. It's because you hit like Jason Kipnis. Yeah, we had you on to tell yeah, you to stop. Yeah. To... <laughs> 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 no, man. I mean, I don't, I don't got the fastest hands in the world. I don't got time for all, all of this extra, you know, this, this hand either. separation. And, 
all the stuff that guys are doing nowadays that's it's really cool to see but um you know get it get it in the zone hold it there and keep it there and you know the other day it worked out i was on i call it the plane train you know it started in houston we called that the plane train when you get those weak hits um gratterall cutter in about you know this far off the plate extremely late i think i hit it below the label uh and double off the left field line chalk <laughs> love that exit velo of Ex- 49.8 exit velo is <laughs> overrated dude <laughs> exit velo is oh, listen you i don't know if you can see this I'm bat saying. i have right here can you can we get a close-up of this bat that i'm holding in the camera hold on do you see the bat do you see this right here yeah yeah you know why i have that on my all my bats when i finish my career because Major League Baseball got so mad at me for breaking so many, they made me tape them so they wouldn't fly in the stands and kill somebody. True story. <laughs> really? That's why I have tape. And pitchers used to say, that's an advantage. I'm like, well, that means you're jamming the shit out of me, and I'm throwing <laughs> yeah. it over the shortstop's head. So, yeah. yeah. Good hitters get that's, jammed. Uh, yep, yeah, that's right. Um, ball so far. Yeah, it's just on plane, extremely late, got beat. Take it. Hey, any way you can get on, especially on that you said it earlier, taking your walks as an offense that has that speed, you take you just get on any way you can. That works. Yeah, and uh, you know it was, and and the Dodgers actually weren't a good team to uh, to have that approach. They throw a lot of strikes. Uh, they'll they're willing to come after you, but you know we're going to play a lot of teams throughout the year that throw a lot of chase stuff, and um, you take your walks when you can get on base and create havoc from there. I think the other advantage is, you know, with speed is, you know, you can turn those walks into doubles. It's, it's hard. It's hard in this league to score from first base. Um, you know, it's hard to put together two, three, four hits in a row. Um, so if we can get on base and, and get those extra bases, you know, we, we, we did a lot in the Dodger series, you know, get the guy gets on first, steal second, another little weak hit, he scores, steals second, and a little weak hit, he scores. So, um, yeah, oh, I think walks are, are big in this game. And especially with all the power, you know, people are getting paid for power th- these days. And, you know, pitchers are getting paid to not give up homers. So, I think with those two things mixing, you, if you're patient, you'll get rewarded. Now, are you – is it now called the Josh Rojas for Zach Grinke trade? <laughs> I don't think so. Not yet. Uh, I don't think I want it that way. You know, I got traded with, you know, those are, those are my boys that got traded with me. Um, you know, they've, they've had some, some injuries have plagued them. Um, hard workers, but you know, it just, they keep getting hit with the injury bugs and, and luckily I've, I've stayed out of there, but you know, those were, those are three really good players that got traded with me. Beer, unbelievable hitter. Um, you know, Bukowski is just the hardest working pitcher I, I've ever seen. Uh, workhorse in the weight room, and and just every time he comes back, it's gets plagued with with something else, and it's uh, it's sad. And then Corbin just was supposed to be one of our guys this year, and, and then right at the end of spring training, had that injury. Um, I think it was like his lat or something like that. So, yeah, I mean, I've been blessed to to stay on the field. You know, I've had a couple small injuries, but. Yeah, those were those were my boys that came with me in that trade. Yeah, you're the prize though right now. That that's fair. Yeah, they're with you and they still got a shot, but you're the prize of the deal right now. So keep yeah. it up, Josh. Keep it up, man. It was good to talk yeah. to you. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, I'm a big fan of the show. Um, this is this is cool to be on. Thank you. Yeah. Love hey, it. anytime, man. Keep doing your thing with Arizona. Keep shocking the world, and we'd love to have you back soon, man. And also, I know these guys are, are jealous of the flow. I am too. He's got way better hair than me. Look at his hair. Look at the natural hair. <laughs> it is. Yeah. That shit's yeah, Yours just, is not it's natural. It's out no. of control right I've now. I've seen you try to make it look like that. <laughs> we're all wearing hats because we're balding. <laughs> I, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. Well, what is that? No, no, no. Gosh, no. you're barring it, man. It's not yours. You're just barring it, okay? <laughs> like, look at Kip. Like, yeah. man, you just barring yeah, it. I'm not there. I'm not Enjoy there. Enjoy it. You're there, Kip. Don't, yeah. don't. I'm not there. Get him wrong. Ride it. Ride it. Josh, good luck today, man. Great Thank to you, have you on. Appreciate you. Thanks, guys. Anytime. Awesome. Awesome. That's How dare cool. they take our banner down? In Hawaii? <laughs> <laughs> Your banner hey, there was, was in the good players the on that team. Gabe Kapler? Okay. What else? Uh, what some Japanese guys you don't know. Okay. 
Gabe Kapler. I thought you were going to just rattle off to Yeah, yeah that's Gabe it. Gabe Kapler. <laughs> yeah, we had one. Guys. We had Gabe. We had Gabe. Game was all Hawaii Winter League champs, baby. All right, well, let's see if you stay hot right now. Ready? It's time for your bet MGM locks of the day. And first, we recap. So let's look back to Friday. AJ wasn't here. Todd Father went hard. St. Louis, Milwaukee, under eight and a half runs. He nailed that. Brandon Woodruff had a day. He put down 330 to win 300 and get himself in pretty good position on the board. Uh, Kratzy, you fell. You went pretty hard there too. Two hundo uh, on a plus one fifty with the Braves run line, and that was me and you straight up against each other. I'm just keeping it in my like rhythm of put down a hundred, or if I'm in minus territory, put down whatever it is to win a hundred. <sighs> Seven and zero oh is a lot of pressure right now. Okay, let's let's show the money bags. A lot of pressure. I just keep like a slow, <laughs> steady pace. Right now, I am the betting expert on this show. That is what it says in the press releases. So, seven and zero, up seven twenty. How you doing, Kratzy? Up two twenty five or two twenty two and fifty cents. He's four and three. Mine's wrong. It's supposed to say four and one. No, it's one and four. <laughs> one and four down four seventy, which is not that much. You can easily climb back. Yeah, in I got two that. days. Just mm-hmm. Don't worry. It's it's very early on in the season. That's like thinking the Rays are the best team ever when they're nine and zero against the three. And Wander Franco's the best player of all time. Superstar. Uh, and Todd Father's up 450. He's three and one. So now let's do our bet MGM locks of the day for Monday. Jason Kipnis, new to the show. Why don't you get us cranking here? Because you got something that we haven't touched yet. A, a unique bet that I think more people might want to get involved in. What do you got? I got uh, the over in the Angels Washington game, the first five innings. I think it was over five and a half runs. I think it was Corbin versus Suarez. I think. Both these offenses look like they're going a little bit better right now than the, these starters did these last times out. So I think they have some uh, runs being scored early in this one. I like Over. that. What are you putting down? Are you starting simple, 110 for a hundo? We'll, we'll start simple, 110 for a hundo. Okay, fair. Kratzy, you follow. I'm going two hunch back to my – because that's when I was winning. I got bullied out of my $200 bets, and I don't like it, and I got scared. I got nervous. Now – I'm back on the train. I'm going two hunch, and I'm riding the Rays at minus one and a half today. At, I think it came off at – when I put it in, it came off at plus, plus 120. 120. So I'm looking to win 240, and that's my lock of the day. And I'm back on back in the winning column. The Rays are playing a non a potential non-100 loss team, Kratzy. Are you sure you're going run line on the Rays tonight? I am. I'm going to okay. ride it. I'm going to ride the Rays until – Either you lose or they lose. One of the two is going to happen. <laughs> What's going to happen first? What's going to happen first? I wake up with pressure in the mornings. And my oh. friend was like, dude, do not even feel a thing. Just keep riding it. You? I'm, I'm taking the Mets money line, minus 135. I'm throwing the 135 down. Why? Scherzer struggled his first couple starts. I feel like he's due for a good start. Plus, the Padres played Sunday night baseball. They had to travel afterwards. A big series against Atlanta, won three out of four. I just feel like they might be a little bit tired. You get off the you get off the plane, you're facing Scherzer in New York. It just it just all adds up for Mets being due for a win and Scherzer being due for a good start. And plus you Darvish pitching on the road and cold. He usually struggles a little bit with that. With the cold weather. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ready? Miami Marlins. Minus one twenty five. Uh-oh. What? Alcantara. Yeah, Alcantara's pitching, but actually, like, surprisingly, it's not like a minus 140, 145. I don't go that high. I'm, I'm not going that long on odds here. I was like, minus 125, Alcantara. I can see how it's a trap game, potentially. Phillies have He's not actually struggled great. against the Phillies. Phillies and on the road. So that's what yeah. the numbers are showing. I'm looking at him as a pitcher on the mound right now and his stuff and also coming off of the World Baseball Classic, and I'm like, sign me up. I, I think he looks better than ever, and that's coming off the of Cy Young season for me. Philly's been struggle city a little bit. I know, you know, Nola hasn't been great off the jump. Matt Strom, I think, is fooling um, BetMGM a little bit with five innings, no runs, um, four innings, no earned runs against the Yankees last time around. But even still, he's not going to go deep. He hasn't really done that yet, and they're not going to let him go deep into the outing. The Marlins offense is not good. They were good yesterday in a 7-2 win against Luis Arise is good. Luis Arise is excellent. And and he is a contact extraordinaire. Garrett Cooper, when he's on the when he's playing, he's a decent bat. So layers, boomer, bust, and he's looked good so far. So I don't know if I, it, it could be close. So I, I was thinking run line, but I was like, nah, not with the Marlins. They're gonna win, you know, four or three games. So Marlins money line. Let's stay hot, okay? Minus 125. 125 to win a hundo, please. 
Keep me undefeated. Knock on wood. I Jason like how Kipnis Scotty. has a much better mug um, than the rest of us right now. Yeah, why can I not get picture. a player? Like a player Claudia picture? Said, don't at me, and we're still doing it. <laughs> we're adding her. <laughs> yeah. I like how Scotty prepared his. Scotty Blue, was like, Blue Steel. Yeah, well, goes, I'm trying to set the tempo. You guys, I, I want like your state your case and give me two, three reasons why. Like convince the people why they should tell you. Because we're right. But I like what you did off the jump. You go like this. You go, okay, guys, are you ready? <laughs> like you're like, what is Scott Braun going to say? Well, if I'm like 12 and 0 or something, people will pay attention to me eventually. People aren't used to seeing me talk about. Right. But people aren't used to you I being right. League. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you maybe that too. Right. Anyway, bet 10, win 200, still going strong. And here's how to get the offer in four easy steps. Sign up, deposit at least 10 bucks into your newly created account on the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android. Download it. If you don't have it, place a pregame money line wager of at least $10 on any MLB team at standard odds price. Then, right away, you receive 200 bucks in bonus bets to use. Bonus code SPICYBALL200. Always bet responsibly. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Woo! Claudia, do you mind if we do that's what he said real quick? We can do it. We can do it in, in two minutes. Okay, let's do it. We're going to run through it. So let's do that's what he said. And we're going to start with the Rockies and Nationals. Since I don't think we're going to talk about them a ton this year based on how the results are going to look. But Kratzy, this was good stuff. little catcher, pitcher, um, former friendship action between Elias Diaz, Rockies slugger, who went deep off his former teammate, Chad Cool who's pitching for the Nats right now. They both started their careers with the Pirates. And Diaz said, cool fights. He competes every time. He gets mad a lot, but it's because he wants to do well. And he also was saying, like, there's going to be a good little text exchange going on. He got his former teammate. I'm sure there was a lot of that going on. Uh, pitcher, catcher, if you get your guy. Absolutely. Yeah, I got a – it's a big Digme story for me. This is This rarely happens. 2013, I got traded from the Phillies to the Blue Jays. I looked on the schedule and I saw we were playing the Phillies in Toronto. It was like a two and two game. We play them at home, play them on the road. And I texted Cliff Lee. I said, Cliff, I said, I got traded. I just beat you because we were going back and forth on this like workout thing. We were sending videos. I would do more pull ups than him. He would, you know, whatever. And I said, not only did I just beat you in the pull up challenge, I said, but. I'm going to hit a homer off you this year. He goes, yeah, right. The exchange rate isn't high enough for you to hit a home run. And we play the last game in Philly, and John Gibbons is walking through the line. We beat we beat the brakes off the Phillies because we had Edwin Encarnacion. And he goes, hey, he goes, you're DHing tomorrow in Toronto because we are going to Toronto. I'm like, wow, I'm DHing? I was hitting behind Edwin Encarnacion. That was his – that was his uh, his protection in the lineup. Eddie was playing first base. Boom, Cliff Lee's pitching, pulling in the second deck off of him. Not only did I call my shot, but I bat flipped him too. So that's my favorite. And so good for good for Diaz for taking cool deep. Anytime you can take a former pitcher deep, absolutely. You're looking at me. What's wrong? <laughs> I mean, I've heard a lot of dig me stories, but man, that two minutes just went to five minutes on Kratz patting himself on the back. That would not have been in my best bet. So Kratz taking him deep. Exactly. That would have been plus a billion. I mean, who hasn't? That would have been plus a lot. Hey, who hasn't taken Cliff Lee deep? I mean, come on. Have you? Yeah. You all have. Good. Good Cliff or bad Cliff? I mean, Cliff and. Cliff in Cleveland, doesn't that count as something? Well, before before yeah. Cy Young or that's after good, Cy Cliff. Young? That's good, Cliff. I I don't remember the year. I don't. I have more homers than you, Kratz. I can't remember. I know. Every day. I, I only have thirty one, so I remember all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Kip, no, no homers off. Uh, no, right? not off. Yeah, he was I think only yeah, you played with him. So no, we didn't play together. Oh, he, he was, was gone. He was he was he was traded to Phillies for Crosco way back Nine. when before oh. me. Yeah. Okay, so my favorite Cliff Lee story is when he was bad Cliff Lee, when he first came up and he was terrible. He's pitching and we're playing <laughs> with – and we bunt. Someone bunts on him and he picks it up and he – I mean, he throws it like, woo, down the right field line when it was still Jacobs Field. And on the mound he goes, why? Why, God? Why does this always <laughs> happen to me? <laughs> we all in the dugout like, because you suck. <laughs> 
And then all of a sudden he got really good and won a site. <laughs> uh, yeah, he got really, really good. That's uh, good. But he was talking out loud like You that. could hear him. He goes, why? Why, God? Does this always happen to me? I mean, he literally picked it up and went, zoomed it down the right field line. Oh, he figured it out. I, I, 100% he figured it out. Okay, I got one more for you for that's what he said. Great little back and forth with Juan Soto and Ronald Acuna Jr. They were playing on Sunday Night Baseball. And Soto described Acuna Jr.'s home run trot. And thanks to Sarah Langs for the screenshot here of Soto saying, okay, he takes two hours. He waves to the dugout. He handshakes the first base coach. Waves to the bullpen. Gives two hops at second. Rounding third. He goes left. He goes right. He jumps up. How did he do on his play-by-play? I, I fall asleep when Acuna hits a home run because it takes him so long. So he nailed it. <laughs> there might know. be a home run trot clock eventually. I don't know how long. I don't know how he remembered all the things. How do you remember all the things he has to do every time he hits a home run? It's his boy and he hits a lot of home runs. No, I'm talking about Acuna. Oh, how does he remember the whole Yeah, routine? the whole skit he has. I don't know. Anyone? It's a lot. I don't know. It's a lot going on. But the yeah. one that he hit in winter ball this year, I think he might have had extra. Like it was, he didn't take a step out of the box until one the was, bat landed and the ball landed in center field. That one in winter ball was that was impressive. I thought that was a walk off. No, I, mean, I, found out was, I found out it was the fourth inning. <laughs> what was the the? Hey, did you play with the uh, Cabrera, Kip? And, yeah, yeah. When he punched the dude in winter ball. Yeah, that was amazing. Now that was you saw that's that. One, one? That's one way to handle it. So the guy hits a home run, he says something to the dugout, and he bat flips, and asks Dribble Cabrera was playing first, and he just freaking decked him when he hit first. In winter ball? In the middle yeah. of the yeah. Lab, yeah. You, like, uh, apparently, what, what, he stuff. did something that was against the rules because he just dropped him. Wow. Killed him. I do not Caught remember him, that. So much, for anything goes, so much for anything goes in winter ball. Exactly. <laughs> All right, let's do a little slap hands time. <laughs> I'll start it off just because this is fresh and we're on live every day, so might as well. Br- Brian Reynolds and Matt Chapman winning players of the week. Chapman's hitting the ball well right now because mm-hmm. he, he hasn't really hit the ball well consistently for Toronto since that. Everyone team. hits the ball well when they play the Angels. Oh, wait. Except hey. for Otani. <laughs> I'm, I'm on that boat. I feel What like. was that score yesterday? 15 to 12 or something? 12 11. Was the it Angels lost. They scored 11 runs and lost. They had two really bad losses this weekend. You see Friday with the bullpen giving it up. What late. about the, what about the one where uh, Otani and Trout they scored three in the first, and the only three hits were Trout and Otani, and the rest of the team went over that like thirty. Is the Angels in a microcosm for sure. years. So you know, Kratz, I love dumping on the Angels right no, now. No, we can't. We got Nevin coming on tomorrow, and then I'm gonna bring it back up. Bring it back <laughs> up. <laughs> it's not Phil's fault. Yeah, yeah, but let's make the it Phil's fault. I'm not, I love Phil. I'll let you guys do that. I love Phil, too. He's a great interview. Uh, the other – and Brian Reynolds, player of the week, while he's in contract negotiations. Like, Kip, I mean, we talked about it last week. Dude is literally battling off the field right now with the cheapest front office in, in baseball who, who already is getting a discount based on what the numbers look like, and they're fighting over the opt-out after four years when he's, like, 32 years old. And it's like the Pirates just want it both ways. It's like, hey, we're not going to pay you as much as you probably should get versus other extensions for the same type of player. And then also we're not going to give you opt-outs. So just take the 100-plus mil. And I'm not knocking on the money in general, but I just love how he's shoving it in their face, being like, I might just mess around and be an MVP candidate this year. His price just keeps going up. It's already not what you want to be doing is playing while you're thinking about that stuff, especially when you're kind of at odds with the front office. It's like you're dragging out an arbitration case where you guys are just kind of not talking to each other and anything you do say isn't going well. But if he just keeps playing the way he is, that number is just going to keep going up and he doesn't have to say much. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'll double back to you because I put this as a reminder for the end. Did you experience any teammates like Eric Kratz did who had a little minor league stint and decided – I don't know these guys. Most of them aren't going to make it anyway, so I'm not paying for their dinner. Not too many. Uh, and I think if I did, it was maybe someone forgot one time or they mm-hmm. they were only pitched for two innings and were out be- the door before and maybe might have slipped their mind. There was one I was thinking of, and I was wondering if it was the same guy Kratz was thinking of. <laughs> so I have to ask him off the air first if it's the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> if not, then we need the story too. Yeah. Dude, that's brutal. To not pay for a spread? Yeah. I mean, I only went on one rehab in my career. Did you crush it? Did you? I paid for three meals. I was there for three days. I paid for three meals. Yeah. 
Which is what you're supposed to do. It's so easy to get like an Outback Steakhouse or yeah. something that they have right there. I mean, we did Outback. We did uh, Cracker Barrel one day. And we did uh, Joe's Crab in Jack House, whatever it's called. Oh, really? Joe's Crab, whatever it's called. Joe's Stone Crab? No, no. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I, don't think wow. they have, I don't think they have Joe's Stone Crab in Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> like, you shipped it up? That's not yeah, yeah, that would have been, yeah, been impressive. <laughs> hey, Kratz, you got Kratz hats for us? Yeah, no doubt. And and for it's for Kipnis too. Columbus Clippers, that's, little that's throwback the old school one. Clippers. This is before Kipnis. Maybe even when you, maybe when uh, AJ played against the Clippers. No, nope. that's happen. like the that's the Yankees Clippers one almost. What yeah, is that? It's back. I mean, it's back then. I didn't play then. We had a throwback night because they have you know they have jerseys all the time. Whoa, whoa, the... whoa, 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 whoa! First of all, oh yeah. First of all. I did not play against the Columbus Clippers because I skipped the International League. Second of all, don't be saying like we had throwbacks back to when you played. You're not, you're not that much younger than me. And no, I wasn't the heck in high the school the same time you were. Like What's that you logo? were already out of high school. What what is that? Is it like a plane? Yeah, it's like a it's like a bat. It's like a bat plane. You see the guys like the like main the main part of the plane is the bat. And then you have the wing out here. Oh, yeah. Wow. I like the ship better. You only have a ship now? Yeah. They do have the ship. Great. Incredible. Electric place. Probably going to – probably going to uh, – Retire your number there? Retire – no, no, no. <laughs> Kip's number. <laughs> I only spent one one year there, but I got like 19 hats. So keep keep waiting. I have a minor league report. So – Orlando Arcia is crushing it for the Braves. Vaughn Grissom down there. And he might come up also as another position again, which is fine too, if Arcia just steals the show. It's not like Vaughn's just shortstop only, but let's show what he was up to down in the bit, in the minors. So um, catcher heads over to the pitcher if you're listening on the podcast version. So does home plate ump, and so does Vaughn Grissom. And his teammate and roommate, at least in spring training, Michael Harris, friend of the show, says this man's so funny without trying. Like, what was he doing there? Did he just? I don't know. It's have kind of a funny. Moment and forget. I mean, it's no, kind it of funny. Innocently funny. He's just following it. I don't even think he was trolling them. You know, like no. I feel like you would do that. Where you're like, all right, I'm going to follow them. They've been calling too what? many timeouts. It's something you would do. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. That's this team. Get, I'd want to know what they were saying. Maybe get a little inside info. That's probably yeah. He probably caught a little bit of it. You know, what was that? Ghost strippers. The bottom? Stripers. Stripers. <laughs> it's like when Jeff Franco had to say slutter the other day on TV repeatedly. <laughs> then he eventually stopped. He was like, He's like, I can't say that anymore. I'm not saying slutter. There's so many new pitches now. Sweeper. Hey, Kim, clap it up. Yeah, good good show. Job. Let's go. Did you like it? I loved it. This was awesome. Quickest two hours in baseball. We're about the same time as a game nowadays. Pace of play, fantastic. Thanks to uh, Kip on his debut. Trisha Whitaker had a great time. Uh, Josh Rojas and Nico Horner solid monday yeah it was a good day yeah we'll see you on tuesday on ft live what should everyone do subscribe please it's free even for you kipness it's free (laughs) free content i love free stuff i'll subscribe for two grand